Good evening, everybody. Being 6 o'clock on September 26th, I'd like to call the Board of Selectmen meeting to order. First order of business, I'm going to have Town Administrator Brendan Zubricki present his Town Administrator's report. Ben Buttrick, if you'd like to join us at the table, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Since we have the Chairman of the Finance Committee with us right now, I think it would be useful to move to the item in my report that talks about the um, fall town meeting warrant. Um, I want to mention a couple of things before we get into the articles. First of all, um, for the fall town meeting, our regular attorney, Greg Corbo, will be at a, has another commitment in another town. So Jeff Blake, which is an attorney that has come to our town meetings in the past, will be covering for Greg in November. Um, I also want to say that we've learned that the town moderator, although he'll be here in the fall, already knows he has a conflict in May. And so the town moderator um, will be um, making a motion, let's see, <clears throat> at the conclusion of the November meeting, um, he's, he's going to announce his appointment for a, a, a deputy moderator. And then I believe uh, the annual town meeting um, that convenes on May 1st will ratify that decision and you'll have whoever he uh, decides to, to name. It will likely be uh, Jody Davis, who has served in that capacity in the past. Thank you. So now moving to the annual town meeting warrant. Um, we have Article 1 being the funding and ratification of the agreement with uh, AFSME which is the labor union that covers um, all of our clerical employees, with some exceptions, and the DPW employees, water, sewer, DPW, et cetera. Uh, that contract was, has been signed, but it wasn't signed in time for the annual town meeting, so this, this uh, matter has been put on the uh, fall town meeting. The next group of articles has to do with the solid waste contract in the town of Essex. Now that's another item in my report, so I think I can merge these. We had first talked with uh, one particular uh, company that was going to potentially allow us to have turnkey services, and they decided that they weren't large enough really to take that on. So then we moved on to another company, Casella, and Casella is, has pro provided us pricing for um, full management of the transfer station uh, as, as well as making sure that we get disposal of solid waste and proper um, transport and, and, and use of recyclables. Casella presently is working to sharpen their numbers after we had another discussion with them. In the meantime, while we're waiting for Casella, the current vendor, Covanta, approached the town and indicated that it may be possible for Covanta to continue to service our account perhaps for another six months. That would be wonderful because we could then move our contract to the fiscal year instead of the calendar year. Um, there would be great continuity because there would hopefully be a way to keep Commonwealth hauling, which does the recyclable hauling and the solid waste hauling right now for Covanta under Covanta's contract, those would be kept in place. So the only change, and we will find out, I believe, tomorrow where they were going to get back to us, the only change would be that the tipping fee for the solid waste will rise sharply, which is something we knew about, to around $93 from around $71 a ton, which is, I can guarantee you, the lowest tipping fee around right now. So, Brendan, does uh, Covanton just want to serve as a bridge, or are they actually thinking they might want to put in a bid? They're thinking that they might want to put a bit in a bid in conjunction with Commonwealth, yeah. because they already yeah. have a relationship, right. and it would just be instead of Covanta running the station and providing uh, the hauling through Commonwealth, it's possible that Covanta would just be the disposal end of it for solid waste only, mm. and that Commonwealth would step in and provide more services. 
and together that would be another type of arrangement. So did they say when they might put that in? It would be before the first of the year? They know that we need that yeah. to happen. They're gonna get back to us. We, we talked about many different possibilities, but they said they needed to go back to their own corners, discuss it, and come back to us with some proposals. Good. So between that and Casella, we think we're gonna have a, a solution. Looking at the articles, um, article two, has to do with establishing a pay-as-you-throw fee, one for a large trash bag, which would be a 30-gallon bag, one for a small trash bag, about half that, 15-gallon bag. We would be using, no matter what happens, we'd be using a, another company that's on the state contract for the pay-as-you-throw. They're known as Waste Zero. Waste Zero will um, provide all of the bags to local merchants and the, the money changes hands between the merchant and Waste Zero, and then Waste Zero sends the money that's collected after merchants pay Waste Zero to the town. Waste Zero also bills us at about, four, I think it's 40 cents per bag for their services because they have to maintain inventory, they have to uh, maintain relationships with the local merchants, um, and so everybody that uses a bag in Essex, 40 sense of that price would be going to waste zero and then the town would set what it needs in order to clear all the contract pricing that we're going to set up um and we think depending on who we go with we know before we get to town meeting that we can understand what the per bag fee would be for each type of bag conservatively assuming that each household will only use one bag a week that would be the case where if you make those assumptions, you set the bag price a little bit higher at first, and that's what the maximum will be. If through the actual um, implementation of the program, we see people are using two and three bags, then the price per bag can come down. So the proposal here is to have town meeting allow the Board of Public Works to set a maximum number, and that maximum number will be in the motion. <clears throat> but it will allow the Board of Public Works as they see the actual pattern to reduce the price as long as it's no higher than that maximum. And so we'll have to right size that as we go Do along. Do we have any indications of uh, whether or not one bag per week is actually conservative from other communities or has the DP done any surveys or anything like that? Um, given the, we, we thought about that and given the fact that we've been a uh, an unlimited transfer station town for as long as we can all remember, um, where people are not accustomed to having to pay more than just the sticker they buy. Um, we feel that at first people will really try to contain it. And so that's, we, th we think that's the behavioral side, but the conservative pricing side, we have to come out of town meeting with the ceiling that yeah. would be as, as everybody clamped down and only used a few bags or right. one bag. So there are two reasons really why we have to start there, but the, hopefully the motion would allow um, for the Board of Public Works to keep moving it down until we hit the right, the right place. Good. More bags per person means less price per bag, et cetera. So that's that one. Um, Article three has to do with the fact that we have a certain amount of appropriations for the current contracts with Covanter and, and uh, I believe it's, um, what's the other, not Commonwealth, um, so recycling. So? No, oh, the recycling no, 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 no. It begins with an M. <laughs> we have someone else hauling us recyclables right now. Dynamic. Dynamic, yes. Dynamic Sorry. is hauling. So, pay for that. Yeah, so yeah. we have certain appropriations in place to pay for things that, contracts that are at a lower price right now. So another thing that has to happen at this town meeting is whatever amount of money has to be appropriated to make up the difference between what our contract obligations are now, which are admittedly lower, and what they're gonna be when we bring on whatever the arrangement is, you have to have that appropriated or you can't spend the money. Our hope is that um, we can claim, and I know the town accountant has to talk with our auditor and with uh, DOR about this, that we can claim that we're going to bring in X amount of money in bag fees as an offset to taxation 
So that will allow us to appropriate the money, but that remains to be seen. No matter what, we have to increase the appropriation because our contract prices, our total contract uh, requirement is, is going to increase. Uh, then we have an article, Article 4, to make improvements to the transfer station. Since we're seizing on continuing to use the transfer station, we have equipment and buildings that were put in place in 1985. In order to continue on with the transfer station, that's going to need to be upgraded. So we're talking about a um, existing trash compactor that needs to be replaced. Thanks. It could be replaced with the style we already have. The style we already have is used to push trash into full-size semi-trailers that are on wheels. That is not really the standard for the industry right now, but if we stay with a company like Commonwealth, um, we would probably go with that again because you also get less hauls per week because the other type of compactor, which is more standard, which is called a breakaway compactor, uses roll-offs to attach to it and they go on the back of a flatbed, a roll-off truck. Um, but they're much smaller. You can't get a roll-off in the size of a semi-trailer. But they're both compactors. They're both compactors. Yeah. <clears throat> so if we end up staying with that, it is an important consideration, and the reason for that is there are longer and longer queues or lines at the disposal places because there's less and less places that are able to do that, and sometimes drivers stay in line for, for nine hours. It depends on the day. It depends on what's going on. And so every time we have a haul, the hauler has to build in not just what it takes to pick it up and bring it there. They have to assume that that driver is sitting in a line for a long time. So every time you repeat a, um, a haul, you're repeating that built-in cost of, of idling a truck with a driver in it. So there are pros and cons to which way we'll go. But anyway, we're going to need a new compactor, one way or the other. We're going to need new garage doors on the building because they are prone to jamming and not working properly. We're going to need new fencing around the back of the transfer station building to make sure that we stay in step with our site assignment from DEP for operating transfer station. We may be looking at purchasing another compactor just for cardboard, and the reason for that is cardboard is um, cheaper to process, and if you throw your cardboard into the single stream waste, it costs more money to get it out of there when if you just keep it separate that is the one benefit you have from keeping something separate. Everything else that's recyclable, single stream, nobody's going to ask you to separate anything else out but cardboard because you get a better deal with it. And there might be other things that, that get put in there. So those are the three featured articles with respect to the transfer station. Um, do you have questions on that? My, my question is on number four. Um, wh when do we think we'll have a quote for the different options? Because it seems to me there's a... Uh, sort of a tension between the upfront capital cost of the, you know, putting in new equipment versus the operating cost over well, time. Well, whichever provider we go with, we still have those capital costs. The right. only way to not have those capital costs is to go curbside. And the policymakers have already decided, at least initially, that's not what the town is doing. So you're going to have those capital costs, whether you go with a turnkey operation like Casella or a group of contracts with running a transfer station means we have to replace the equipment. Although the large compactor is significantly different than the smaller one, or is there? It's significantly different because only certain uh, haulers will haul that type of right. trailer. But it's, and it is more expensive, but not significantly so. Okay. It would be cheaper to buy the breakaway. Yeah, that's but, the standard. That's yes, the standard. But there are more hauls per week yeah. with all of that built into it. And so we'll have to do the cost benefit, which we'll be able to do. So to by, answer your by question, the fall town yeah. So tomorrow we're going to get more information from Covanta. Now, if we end up just going with six months status quo, then we're going to have a lot more time uh, to to figure out how we're going to do things. What will happen though is pay as you throw will still begin on January first. So we'll work all that out, and then Casella will be getting back to us soon, although we don't have an exact date, but definitely before fall time meeting.
Great. Thank you. Sure. And then for the town accountant, we don't know yet, but we're hoping to run whatever this transitions to where we're pay people are paying bag fees and the bag money is coming back to the town and then the town has to use the money to pay its contractors. We're hoping that we can still run it as a line item budget situation as opposed to having to set up a revolving fund or even hopefully not an enterprise, okay? You don't have any new information yet. It's gonna be the same as what we do now. That's good. Right. Uh, or find other mechanisms in the budget, tax rate recap to you know, work around. Right. It sounded like that's more of a. Right. So, r right now, we get a flurry of sticker fees at one time of the year. You take that money in, it goes into the general fund, but we've already established the budget for the, uh, for the transfer station, and we know that that money is, is a full offset to taxation, and that's how it works. Now we're going to have probably monthly payments coming in from Waste Zero. So throughout the entire fiscal year, you're getting payments and you're making payments out. And hopefully, again, we can count on all of that as an offset to taxation and continue just with a, uh, a line item budget, which is why we have to increase the, the appropriation. If we need another article in there, we'll tell everybody right away. How are we doing for time? One, uh, 6.16. Okay. The next article has to do with um, a recommendation of the Economic Development Committee, which would be to look for properties in town that are owned by the town, but that should be um, perhaps sold because they're not of any real value to the town. So Gregory Island is an area that has a lot of small slivers of land next to people's property, between two properties, et cetera. It's not anything that's particularly valuable to the town, but it might be considered valuable to people who want to expand the size of their yard or something like that. And so all of those parcels have been put into this article. Town meeting would just be authorizing the town the, through the Board of Selectmen to, to sell the parcels, and then there would be a complete process later that the Selectmen would run if the authority is granted that would actually seek to market and sell the parcels. But there's no requirement for the homeowner or anybody to buy the, the property from the town. No, in fact, we and tried to do this out at Kenoma Point and there were people that lived around it and the, ultimately no one bought it. And there's no limitation to who can buy it? No. Okay, so it doesn't have to be somebody who's- If somebody perhaps or... wanted to have a boat there or something and they have yeah. a way in and they yeah. leave the boat in that piece yeah. of land or yeah. something like that. That's possible. <clears throat> Article six uh, is creating a new fund. So you know that we have several special purpose funds. This would be another one. Rather than an older concept that the town had used, which was to take town money and pay to a particular group who bid on a contract for promoting the town's attractions, this would instead use town money to uh, beautify and maintain public areas in the town that would serve as an enticement for people to come anyway. Um, we look at things like streetscape improvements, pocket parks, plantings, and banners, perhaps if we, if we end up with uh, the new street lights. And so this would just set up the fund and a, a, an amount of money could go in it to get it started. $5,000, we've, we've done this type of thing before. Another th article that the Economic Development Committee recommended was to look at some money to immediately beautify some things in the town. Article six, the one before it, would set up the fund and that would be more of a long-term look. Article seven would be, what, what can we do right away to kind of jumpstart this process? Because in article six, you're not gonna put money in and then appropriate it out again. That's not the function of that article. And, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, so, so who, would, who would drive the, the, 
process of saying, okay, we've got this money in the stabilization fund, we'd like to use it. The now. Economic Development Committee would serve as an advisory board making those recommendations. And then the Finance Committee and the Selectmen would look at their recommendations on an annual basis and determine whether they agreed or not. And it would come up to a two-thirds vote. Perhaps go on the warrant, yeah. It would be a two-thirds vote to get it out of that account, yes. Um, so what is it that the Economic Development Committee has in mind right now for immediate needs. There was a discussion at that, of that at their most recent meeting, but we're not sure yet we're ready for this. And the, one of the key reasons is this. The town planner has applied for a placemaking grant for the downtown area, which could help us plan how to do this more appropriately. And that includes the vacant lot that's next to us right now. And most people on the committee said that's where you should really start to beautify because now you have this grassy plot, but if you do it right, you could have a much more attractive uh, area for townspeople and for visitors alike. And if we find out that that grant comes in before town meeting, this article might be indefinitely postponed because that grant would be the money that would make the design and the um, the planning for this type of thing, but it wouldn't imp it wouldn't be implementation money. It would just be designing Correct. the town in general, right? right. Um, but at least you would be doing that rather than saying, "Well, we're going to spend on this, this, and this right now," without even having a plan or a design yeah, for yeah, which yeah. way we should go. Yeah. So that's kind of why that's up in the air. But it will it can stay on here because you might not get the grant, and then right. the committee will make a recommendation. Would Article Seven also include um, architect design funds? So that it could be a plan of a particular um, parcel, or would it we could be? add that? There's, yeah. there's time to add that. Is that something the board wants to consider? I think it would be important. If you don't yeah. get the grant, I think you'd kind of yeah. need that yeah. too. Yeah, agreed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Great. Article eight. Um, now we're talking about those street lights that I mentioned. So the town has received. $160,000 in a grant from Mass DOT. It's a placemaking grant. The decorative lighting uh, uh, fixtures qualify as placemaking because A, they make the downtown more cohesive and, and more quaint, but also you can put plantings on, on these, on hangers, you can put banners on these things, seasonal banners and change out displays and things like that. The causeway, when they did the improvement of the causeway a number of years ago, has uh, 52 places where they already have buried in the ground, cut out boxes, and then conduit for, for wiring future streetlights. The forethought was put into that. We've since found that there's no way to do that, 26 on either side, there's no way to do both sides because of sidewalk constrictions, et cetera. So we already have a plan to be on one side or the other depending on where we are in the streetscape. Right now, the um, grant that we have doesn't even cover all of the area where we have conduit in the ground, okay? So the next step would be to move to, the grant does this much of it, and then town money perhaps does additional um, <coughs> light poles in the area where the, with the remainder of the area where conduit is in the ground. We've already gotten a price on that and that's gonna be another $100,000. Beyond that, there are areas on either side of where the conduit is. So from like Dunkin Donuts back towards Southern Avenue and from, I think it's just after the bridge to Western Avenue I think it's from Martin Street to yeah. Martin Street to yep. We have two areas where there's no conduit at all. And so we've gotten pricing on if the town wanted to do it all at once, and we did these two areas, which are basically from scratch areas, right? Because there's no conduit, there's nothing. How much will that cost? And I have pricing on that. Thank you. And so 160 covers part of the area that already has conduit. That's the grant. Another 97, so I said $100,000 covers the rest of the area that already has conduit in it. So but that's to, from Martin Street to Dunkin' Donuts, those mm -hmm. two, yeah. Then to move on from Martin to Western Avenue, that's another 270,000, because now you're ripping up the sidewalk, putting, putting in, in conduit. conduit, and putting the sidewalk back. 
to go in the opposite direction um, from west. No, I guess it's 211 that way. It's 270. Uh, it's because how we labeled it. Mm -hmm. It's 211 and 270 for either end, okay? So now you're into some very substantial money. So the point of the discussion is, do you have an appetite for doing that next zone? The next uh, zone would be the next part that has conduit. That's about $100,000. Moving out from there, you're looking at another 400000 or more dollars. Um, <clears throat> also, we did ask, in the areas where there's no conduit, how much would it be to put in solar lights, because there's a new type of light where the coating on the light itself is the solar collector. We're not talking about lights that have the big panel on it, because trying to bring in a nice aesthetic kind of gets canceled when you do that. Right now, at the cost of those lights, which might get better, but because they're new, right now, that's actually more expensive than running conduit, okay? But either way, right? The outer areas, we call them, you know, zone one is where the grant is, zone two is the rest of the conduit, zones three A and B are the areas that have nothing yet. Zones three A and B are going to be very expensive. And so I guess we need to start the conversation there. Do you have an appetite for going beyond zone two right now? I would say it might be worth if MAPC has some sort of a program where they can assess pedestrian use in those zone 3a and b to see if it's valuable i mean if it's like 10 percent of what they see in zone one and two then maybe it's not worth even doing solar but if it's equal to or somewhat close it might be worth sure and and i can point. definitely ask that but i know we won't have that data by fall town oh meeting. sure no so definitely i not. guess my I question would... is does the town have an appetite to potentially approve zone two at fall town meeting or do you want to get more information and let the grant just put in the, the issue is you're going to you're going to save money if you do zone two because you save on the mobilization right and on the bulk purchase and you also get more of a continuity in the area than if you just did half of essentially the causeway yeah right what do you so, think ruth I mean, following the Economic Development Committee meetings, I think for them and their goals, it's important to focus on Zone 1 and 2. Yeah. I'm not sure that I have an appetite for 3A and B at this point. I think it's expensive. Great. I think it's something I want to look forward to, but I'm not sure that now is the right time with yeah. all the other projects we have facing us. I agree. I, and I think maybe um, Zone 3A and B should be looked at if we can. Through, yeah, and I'll, I, I can do look it sometime at that. in the I future. Will look at that. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you do zone one and two, you're at least fully leveraging the asset that was put in the ground a number of years ago. Right. You know, and, which, and which the, would cost a lot of money today. And it the was, mobilization and all that. That's right. Yeah. And that conduit was put in at no expense to the town. And you, as you can see, it's very expensive if you have to put more in today. Yeah. So um, to the finance committee, Mr. Chairman, um, is that something you can bring back? I mean, we have an article considering it, and the amount of money would be around $100,000. Yes. Uh, okay. I'll For zone that, two. Put that as an agenda item on our next meeting. And are we okay on time? Or? We have two more minutes. Okay. I think I can do article nine. <coughs> has to do with... Um, there's a property for sale that's in 61A, agricultural use. When somebody gets that tax break, the law allows the town, when the property goes up for sale, to have a right, re right of first refusal on the bona fide offer that comes in for the purchase of that property. We do not yet have either a notice from the seller or a copy of the purchase and sale agreement, although it's under our understanding that should be coming to us any day. And so we have no idea what the cost even is, but this is on here because the town will have this opportunity, whether it wants to pay the price or not, the opportunity will be there. And then I guess I'll pick it all up after the next appointment. Chairman Buttrick, if I could ask you to step back into the audience, I'm going to be having, um, I have a 6.30 appointment, oh, sure. and then I'm going to invite you back to the table. Yep. Thank you. Is it Mr. or Doctor? No, I'm, I'm the resident. 
Just oh, <laughs> we're looking for Thomas Starr. Well, you could be a doctor. Who knows? Medical doctor. Is, is Thomas Starr here? He's, and he's not, on, not online either. Not online. I don't see him in the room, and we don't see him online. So perhaps uh, you'll make his way in later. Okay. So Can I, should I comment on that, or we know, if he doesn't come, we won't pick it back up? I'll probably just table it. Okay. Unless, unless we want to go forward. We don't need him here to discuss it. But you could talk about it after. Sure, we can. Sure. After the, these guys with the warrant. S Chairman Buttrick, if you'd like to join us, it looks like my appointment is late. <laughs> I do. Too much paper. <laughs> All right, back at it. Um, articles 10 and 11, we're told by the planning board that. Well, wait, um, back to Article 9. Yes. Um, why does the town want to consider purchasing that? Because it backs up to the town transfer station, and the thought there is, since we have the Landing Road Bridge, yep. which may or may not so stay in back, service. It's back to that issue of another access. Correct. Okay. And so you would, you would cross the Apple Street Bridge, which, has, which probably has more potential, obviously, to, to stay intact than the one at Landing Road. Yeah. And so it's a strategic decision of the town. And if the town wants to go for this, you would be getting, I, th I think it's close to 10 acres. A road would run through it, not necessarily even right away, right? Because if Landing Road continues to function, you have this for the future. It's just an opportunity. So, so, so I have a question just out of ignorance. Would this land be appropriate at all for affordable housing? It, it certainly could be. Yep, because if the town does buy it and you have the ability to run a road through it, what would you do on either side that flanks it? Maybe nothing or maybe something. Right. So that's There's possible. Sewer there, is there? Yes. Yeah. So, but, but it's buildable. As, as far as I know, it's been, a, it's been an agricultural field for a long time. We, I don't, I'm not aware of it. Where does it sit vis-a-vis -vis the marsh and, and the river and, and so forth? It, 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 it gets close to both the Alewife Brook and um, I think that's mostly it. Um, but it, there are possibilities there. Yeah, and that certainly seems something possibly yep. of interest. So it's on here as an opportunity, and we'll know more about it, which you can discuss the selectmen meet again in just one week, and so you'll discuss it again. <clears throat> Articles 10 and 11 have to do with the planning board putting a couple of, uh, of articles on the table. We don't know exactly what those are yet, but we were asked to put a placeholder in there. Um, I'm going to check in with them. And we also heard that perhaps they won't be ready with either one of them. And if we don't get them this week, I think it's going to be hard to turn that around with town council and vet everything. And they also have to do public hearings because there's zoning articles. Article 12 um, is the ability to perhaps um, put more money, as is normally done in the fall, into the various set-aside or special purpose funds. Article 13 is changing a revolving fund that currently exists for purchasing supplies, pharmaceuticals, for the public health nurse and for public health nurse labor, which is something that was set up in the past before the pandemic. Knowing what we focused on more recently, the Board of Health would like to change the purpose to expenses, supplies, and contractual services to operate emergency dispensing sites and clinics. And to increase the annual throughput from $10,000 to some other figure, I have 30 as a placeholder, it could be even higher than that. Um, and this just allows money that gets collected from insurance to help seed, pay for expenses and also seed the next clinic, et cetera. So this money would stay with the fund. Article 14 is, if necessary, replenish the sewer maintenance line and the sewer enterprise fund. I'm going to know by next meeting, I think, from Superintendent Galley whether they need this or not. It's a placeholder for now. The same with Article 15. Is there any expense that needs to be replenished in the water maintenance line? Now, remember, that money would not come from the general fund. It would come from uh, free cash in each of the enterprise funds. Article 16 um, 
would be if there's sufficient free cash and the Board of Public Works wants to recommend this to um, purchase an, some additional grinder pump replacements, which is what they've been working on. We were able to uh, spend against the sewer betterment interest reserve that had been in place, but DOR changed that rule. So now we can only spend in smaller amounts with regular free cash that comes in. So we'll see if they have uh, a use for that now, or perhaps the money they already have will get them through until the fall, I mean, until the spring. We don't know. Then Article 17, replenish the Finance Committee's reserve fund. Now, we always have this on the fall town meeting because by this time of year, usually the reserve fund has been hit for this or that. Now, I want to bring up something that's coming our way. There's been a change in regulations in the state elevator arena for the state elevator regulations which now require all elevators to meet a certain fire service safety recall standard where a firefighter goes into the elevator or stands outside it and operates a switch to tell the elevator to go to different floors during a fire. Normally, and what is not in place in, in older elevators, is the elevator is trained to go to the lobby and stay there. This is a new standard we have to meet. We've been told we have to meet it by the end of December. It's kind of a quick thing cutting in on us. Um, <clears throat> the new elevator in the new public safety facility is compliant. The elevator from 2007 in the senior center is not, and even this 2017 elevator in Town Hall is not. It's a new standard. The cost will be just over, uh, just, a little, just under $13,000. My recommendation would be, and I don't know when I can get um, a vote of the Finance Committee, would be to spend on this now with the Reserve Fund and then just replenish that with the article that you see here. Do you have an idea of when we might be able to get a vote of the Finance Committee on that? Probably October 11th. Okay, that's good. Because um, there, there are lead times on the circuit boards that have to be replaced. And we'll have, I mean, that the 13,000 will have something definitive at that point. It's 12, well, right now, my understanding is it's like 12,550, yeah. Okay. Because we have quotes, and I can get the quotes to you with the reserve fund transfer request. But before I do that, I want to ask the board, is it okay to approach the finance committee with that request? Yes, please. Yeah. Everybody's okay, okay with we'll that? Add, we'll add it. When did we find out about that? It seems we like found out about window. that just just two weeks ago. And yeah, so they give you three they, months. Our elevator vendor apologized to us that they did not tell us about it when we had our inspection back in May of Town Hall. The reason they didn't is they thought we got that communication from the state. We didn't. We didn't get any communication, and all of a sudden, this quote for this elevator work shows up in my inbox. And I said, well, first thing I'm going to do is call the state to make sure this is true. And I, I have vetted all of that. It's absolutely required. And so now we're just catching up. And I said to them, well, there was no failure on the senior center because the senior center was last inspected in December 2021 before the new thing came into, into being, which I think was in March. So I said, can you go back and, and look at that? I said, there's got to be that that doesn't comply if the 2017 elevator doesn't comply. Right. I was correct, and now we have quotes on both. So it's simply a circuit board that needs to be installed. And some and wiring and maybe stuff. some yeah. key, whatever. But it's not any real major physical. And the one for the senior center has a four-week lead time because it's an older model. Yeah. Okay, but that can all be taken care of. And if we can give them a green light on October 12th, great. That'll be done. I mean... It's either that or you wait and, and get the money later, but the, the price is only going to go up. Yep. It's not going to go down. Yep. Article 18 is if we're going to put more money into the other post-employment benefits trust, OPEB trust. This is essentially a fund for employee health insurance where if you accrue a good amount of principal, the interest in that fund ends up paying for your employee, uh, your retiree health insurance in perpetuity. And we're on a path to go up toward, what, three and a half, four million dollars? Uh, so do you think the Finance Committee will look at another couple hundred thousand or something like that? Definitely. The yeah. question is going to be, yeah, how much? Right. Especially if you're considering buying a parcel, which could be expensive, and you're considering funding lighting. 
could use that for, yes, you could use that. And I know that people have, who have worked on the Konomo Point sale of real estate issue in the past have always said, policymakers, have always said they'd love to see if that money is to be spent, love to see that money being spent on another real estate asset because we got the money from a real estate asset, namely the sale of some property at Kenomo Point. And I think there's two point something million left in that fund. Probably, yeah. So that's a distinct possibility. All right. Um, in addition, if there are any changes to any element of the FY23 operating budget, whether that's general fund or either, either of the reserve funds that, that come up, um, that's Article 19. I don't know of anything, anyone asking for anything yet. Jeff, I don't know if anything's come up against you. We always carry an article like that because it allows you to cure any problems that, that cropped up in the first half of the fiscal year. And then finally, and I know of a couple, I think, so far, unpaid bills from past fiscal years. We kind of always have that somebody bills us late, and under the law, you can't pay a, a late bill after the fiscal year closes out until you go to town meeting. It's a nine-tenths vote at a special town meeting, which our fall town meeting is. That, that is the warrant, and so the, you know, that gives you a good idea of all the financials that will come up at town meeting. Um, before I close the topic, though, I know that the Essex Fire Department has come forth to say since they're getting new handheld radios through the emergency dispatch center in Middleton, their truck and vehicle radios are going to be outdated. And so we're getting a benefit of the upgrade to the handhelds, but I think I'm going to be approached soon for an article on the town meeting warrant for the vehicle radio purchase. Is everybody okay with, with adding that in? Sure. Yes. Okay. So they, I don't understand why. Why does the one make the other? Because we're, we're getting a, a great benefit by getting, at, at no cost, the handheld radio upgrades. Right. And, and Ruth, you might have a comment on this. Sure, I can speak to this. So we, we I believe we received 43 radios at about $11,000 a piece. They're digital radios. And the radios in the trucks are not digital radios. So their communications are not, they don't cro okay. they're not cross speaking, especially um, they're not necessarily looking to outfit all of the vehicles all at once, but they would like to make sure that the vehicles that are out of town vehicles that, that respond on mutual aid and that are called for by other communities have the capability of responding directly with regional dispatch for other communities. So I don't have a number. I have a 9 a.m. meeting with the fire chief to firm that up. Okay, okay. got it. And then the only other thing is, and this is not a financial article, the Conservation Commission has indicated that they might like to see a wetland protection bylaw, a local bylaw, put in place in Essex. Right now, we go under the auspices of the Wetlands Protection Act, which is a state law. There are many towns that also have a local bylaw that have more restrictive requirements. Our understanding, it, so we have a draft of that, and I know the board has seen the first draft of that, but we don't even know yet whether the co full commission supports it in its current form or some other form. I'm hopefully going to have more information about it on the third, um, but it's kind of coming a little bit later in the game, and I've told the co-chair person who asked about it that as time goes on, there's less and less of a chance of properly vetting it with town council and with this board, et cetera. So that's something that's out there, and I'll bring it back to the board, but that could be added on to the um, warrant if it's your pleasure to do that. And I don't know, there, let me look to see if there's anything else that is uh, financially related while you folks are still here. I know that the Economic Development Committee, you know, as I said, they just had their meeting. They're recommending the articles that we went over. Um, for you, Chairman Buttrick, um, they would like to, at least their chair would like to have an audience with the Finance Committee just to go over kind of these new goals. So between you and Jeff, maybe you could reach out to the chairman, it's Jody Harris, mm -hmm. perhaps for an upcoming meeting, because they did express wanting to have that audience. Do, do you know by when, Brendan? Prior to, before the fall time prior meeting. Prior to fall time meeting, okay. yeah. 
So, Brendan, I know that one of the items on your report is reporting on the collaboration committee meeting. Yes. I wonder if Ben might be able to also contribute to that. As to yeah, I mean, it was we have this, you know, several new faces who are on the, um, uh, you know, from from the Manchester side. So a lot of it was just sort of getting an update on you know, what's going on with respect to the two towns. Uh, I was district. struck in, in particular about the discussion that, that basically you brought up towards the, at least the end of the meeting that I was able to attend, uh, which was the, the portions of the strategic plan which related to the school and, and, and our goals and, and, and needs and wants. Because it, what it did is it brought up to me, basically, the, the same question that we had last year, the same back and forth, if you will, between, essentially between Essex, the town of Essex, and the school administration as to the propriety or, or the, the, the sense uh, and what the role of the Finance Committee in particular and, and the Board of Selectmen is in terms of getting information from the school uh, uh, about the current operations and, and the, the level of detail and so forth and so on. Did, did you get that sense that this was sort of just a re- Yes, I mean, ba well, basically, the uh, it's uh, what we were talking about was section or six. goal number six, six of the strategic mm. plan, right. which refers to uh, the basically free flow of, of information and transparency between the district and the Essex Finance Committee. And the right. point that was being made by the district is that the administration of the district is beholden to the school committee Correct. and not specifically to the, to the finance committees. Correct. And so they viewed it through a structural lens as basically, you know, um, that needs to be worked through with the school committee. Correct. So, yeah. But that's where we were last year, and that was, I don't want to call it, that's, there was a, a healthy discussion back and forth about the level of participation of the finance committee in, in the detail of, of the, the, the financial reporting and, and so forth of the school committee to, I mean, of the administration to the school committee. So did, did you feel that, that there was um, was, th was this the same issue, unresolved, or is it a resolved issue? I know that the administration spoke up and said, well, you know, if you really want to get to this level of immersion in the finances, then maybe we need to look back at the, at the fundamental, at the, at the, the fundamental uh, uh, agreement uh, between the towns as to how the school was going to be run. Well, I think that I think that the main issue is specifically around the question of reporting of actual versus budgeted data, and right. whether the uh, whether the school has the ability to to make the reporting of actual data. So, right. you know, I, I I consider that still to be an open issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think that... It, it, so what did you take uh, the administration's comments relating to, well, maybe we need to go back and look at the basic contract between as to what the roles of the town are in the running of the school? Well, I came away from the meeting feeling like, okay, well, I need to read that section of the agreement. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. You know, of the district I'm just uh, one, between I'm just the towns. I'm not certain we're any, we're any far different from where we were towards the end of last year where we were sort of going back and forth at, at you know, as, as to the level, you know, how that. 
Yeah, I mean, I have two next steps that came out of that meeting. One was, uh, one was to review the agreement, mm -hmm. uh, the district agreement, and then number two, uh, to work with Teresa Whitman, uh, who right. is the, you know, mm -hmm. um, the liaison between right. the finance committee and the I school committee. Be, I and I think you know, it's because if we can get on the same page there, then I think that'll. You know, I we'll, just we'll don't want to go progress. forward and, and, and get wrapped up in this sort of back and forth that we, similar to what we had last year, which I didn't think was that productive. Right, but I think the two things that, uh, I think the two sort of specific reporting questions have to do with enrollment numbers. Yes. Because that affects the apportionment and the degree to which we can get that as soon as possible because that has such a material impact on our budget here in Essex. And then, and then the question around at least getting an interim report on right. the trend of the budget. And, um, but I think that the raising it as a structural issue doesn't really make any progress toward, no, I, you know, I, I, the, I totally the, agree. the specific But I just, so I don't want to get, yeah. get down, bogged down. The other, yeah. the other thing I would say about the meeting was uh, Brendan did in his sort of review of, of, the, of where the town stood, is that the town, the selectmen, and, and the finance committee haven't yet taken a position on an override. Uh, and there was some questioning from the administration about that. So I, I, I thought that was important uh, information. Did they have a time frame of when they'd like to know? I would say no, they did not. Okay. Didn't yeah, really. but, the, but the thinking is next spring. Okay. Right. Because no, no, it, no, it, I mean, it would have to be to have, for, to yeah. have the select. No, I know what you're that, saying. Yeah. You know, to have by when should you have a view? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A position. Yeah, I mean, I think just to sort of tie this out to this conversation tonight. I mean, um, getting back to all of the articles uh, or the financial articles for the warrant. I mean, there's a there's clearly a laundry list, and they you know there's a range. They range from critical to discretionary. And we don't even have a, a certified free cash number yet. So what we don't really understand is how much flexibility and latitude we have. And I mean, I know that's a separate issue, but it still relates to the burden on the town. And so I think, um, you know, I think the, the, what we did get a sense of from the collaboration meeting is sort of what roughly the, what, what the, the number, number is, is. Which is, which, which is eye-opening. Yeah, which is w about 1.5 million. Um, well, when you factor. Right, but, but then in a, so. For Essex or total? No, that's total. Total. Yeah. So that if but you, then, you, yeah, but then there was <laughs> also the uh, unknown additional uh, out, outlay on the out of, out of district. The, the two things were the out of district and right, right, but I think he's one point. They said there's a 1.5, uh, sorry, a 1 million structural, structural deficit. deficit. Structural deficit. I think you, yeah. you added the five in as an estimate of those other things, like contractual obligations exactly. that are an unknown right, health care. Right, right. So one and a half is a working number. It's a ballpark yeah. figure, yeah, yeah, and that is that is total between the two towns. So, um, yeah. At any rate, I'll come back on the, uh, you know, those, those, Next yeah. steps, yeah. because there, I, I know we also have to lock down the strategic plan. Too. Yeah, so just, I mean, when you're, you know. you're right, when we when we look at the warrant and we talk about well, we want to spend money on this and, and money on that, we know that coming up probably in the spring of twenty three, right? There's another big number probably out there waiting for us, right? That yeah, the yeah. override. <laughs> so. Mm. And I think that's it. That would be. Go ahead, Chairman. Before before Chairman Buttrick leaves, um, so I, I sorry that we're jumping all over the place here. But before I let you go, um, goal nine of the strategic plan is a is a, a school committee article, but it does directly relate to the finance committee. So at the finance committee meeting on August fifteenth of this year, I joined you along with Annie Cameron, chair of the uh, strategic planning committee. And my takeaway from that was that the finance committee generally was not in support of having a number defined in the strategic plan. I think that the sense at the table was that the finance committee did not feel that it was very strategic to 
be beholden to a specific number. And I know that your goal from my takeaway from that meeting was that you were going to bring that back to collaboration, discuss it there and see if that number could be, I think, removed as a specific number and change some language. So I'm curious how that um, conversation went during the collaboration. Number for what? This is the, you're so, talking about the three and a half percent. The three and a half. So under, under goal nine, so that everybody joining us knows, goal nine, goal nine, number C says, the town of Essex will work collaboratively with MERSD during the budget season to strive for an overall apportionment based spending growth at or below 3.5%, which translates to two different apportionment figures when broken down for the two towns. If 3.5 overall apportionment growth or less is not possible and a correction or an override is necessary, the district and the two towns will work together to ensure the budget increase aligns with district goals and town spending priorities and limitations. And I think that, again, my, it was my takeaway from the August 15th meeting was that this finance committee didn't feel that having a very specific hard number was strategic because we don't, I think that right now, kind of just the world in general is a little unsure. Um, CPI is up, finance rates are going up, and I think that we said having something that we're beholden to is a little risky because what if things shift and we don't have the funds to support that growth number? And I think you were going to take that back. Was that discussed? Yeah, actually, we didn't discuss that. Um, okay. And but I can also consider that part of the follow up to the conversations that we did get have because we did get sort of derailed on the the whole structural question of the interaction between the district and yep. the finance committee. Mm -hmm. So that's still pending. One other Ruth. big big takeaway or talk uh, from meeting to me was the brief discussion of the contract negotiations and how that's going to be slightly different and you know, it's going to be a more challenging effort. Right, and that's still, I mean, they have a one-year extension on the budget and that's obviously material and particularly with each month of inflationary data that comes in, I think there's concern about the impact that that's going to have. But, um, but, but Ruth, your, your takeaway from that meeting is correct. I mean, it doesn't make sense to have a hard number written into the agreement because the reality is, is that, you know, there's, you're going to have variation based on it, you know, overall CPI that's going to, you know, uh, be an impact. So, uh, well, it says in the strategic goal, th three and a half or less. So are we thinking maybe it should be higher? I don't think it should. I don't think we should have a hard number. I think it's not strategic to yeah. be. I agree. I agree. But I I'm don't just feel asking, like it's asking that question if that's a legitimate possibility that might be higher. Well, we were we were we went in at 3.5 this year and with apportionment we were at 4.93. So I certainly am not suggesting that we change that number to go higher because with apportionment we can, we're going to see ourselves higher and I think we're in for it again this year that we'll be on the higher end of that apportionment. Yeah. So no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting removing it altogether and just saying that we're going to work with the district to make sure that the needs of our district are met. Um, between the two towns, yeah. but I don't like having a number defined. Yep. It's not strategic, and this is a five-year plan, and we're going to be held to this for the next five years. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think you're going to have disagreement, uh, you know, from from the district on that decision. The question is, what do we put in its place? How do we actually word that language? That's going to be what matters. That's where the finance committee comes in. <laughs> October 11th, I'll be there. <laughs> And the only other thing I had for Chairman Buttrick was um, later in the meeting, the selectmen are going to start talking about the um, convening of the Affordable Housing Trust mm -hmm. that passed at town meeting. It was approved by the Office of the Attorney General. The bylaw prescribes that one member of the Finance Committee should serve on that. It requires a unanimous vote of the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen because the Finance Committee bylaw doesn't allow finance committee members to be on other boards unless those votes are taken. So it's another thing you could perhaps take back and maybe bring forward to the, uh, to the selectmen a recommendation for a member. All right, we'll add that to the agenda. That's everything I had that was, I think, that was financially related. Although everything is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so feel free to stay, but I'm going to move on. Um, All right. We talked about the finance committee's. Thank you. Yeah, we talked about the finance committee's role in the strategic plan. Uh, noting that the strategic plan uh, is going to have a um, look under the hood on October 6th when the strategic planning committee is going to have an all virtual forum that is uh, listed on the selectman's reminders. Um, people, if you're interested in looking at the strategic plan in advance or at least the working draft of it, uh, are, people are encouraged to, to go to the town website you can see a link to that content from the homepage. You can also go to the Strategic Planning Committee page and see that content. Does the board have any, um, any comments on the strategic plan or that process? No, that's a Zoom though, right? Yes, it's, yeah. it's completely virtual. We've already discussed the Economic uh, Development Committee. Um, earlier in the, in the uh, meeting. The Route 133 Essex River Bridge Replacement Project. Uh, just a notation that th my report said that the main beams for the new bridge are going to be laid the evenings of October 3rd and 4th. We found out today that that's slipping to the October 4th and 5th with the rain night, because it will be night work of October 6th. Again, the hope there is get the beams in place um, by early October, get the concrete deck poured shortly thereafter in the sidewalks, and then the contractor can work over the winter with uh, hanging the new utilities on the new bridge. We already talked about the dynamics that are under underway with respect to a couple of different options for operating, continuing to operate the transfer station. So that's already been covered in the meeting. Folsom Pavilion, uh, we have had a meeting with the uh, kind of the volunteer that's heading that up, Dan Mayer of Mayor Tree Services. Um, he's indicated that he's moving forward with the milling of raw, raw trees basically to make lumber and that the joinery on after the after the trees are milled into boards should happen maybe even this winter it's possible that using some of the hundred and fifty thousand dollars that town meeting approved toward uh, materials for the new structure that footings could even go in before frost this fall it's also possible that they will move to, instead of a wooden floor, a concrete floor, because that's easier to clean, especially if you're going to be using this pavilion as a source of revenue, rentals, et cetera. Uh, so we're hopeful to see the project kick off by the spring nonetheless. The memorial benches at Kenomo Point, the board talked about that at the last meeting because another party has come forward to ask whether they could donate a bench along the riverfront. I think the board was going to go on a site visit. Has, did that occur? I went out. Um, did you guys? I never saw anything back from you guys. Oh, uh, we did. Oh, you did. I, yeah, I communicate. I did reply all. So we did do a site visit at 430 on September 21st. Um, we walked the site with the as built from the um, from the seawall project, I actually did identify all of the benches with names, so we have that for the future if we need it. Um, in walking, I identified, so that the spot that was asked for was overlooking Mooring Field G beside the Nancy Brutel Gallant bench that was recently installed. And- Down by the anchor. Down by the anchor, yeah. right in that same kind of half circle there. and. My feeling is, so we, we currently have 19 benches down there, um, the Gallant bench being 20, mm. because there were already 13 identified, which I have the names, there's five more um, in the park, and actually there's five other benches that aren't 
specifically high back benches, but more of like a low seat. So sure, one could argue that you might have granite. the flat yeah. granite ones. There's five of those. So we're up to 24 ish. Um, I did circle here in the as built a potential spot. So I do feel that we probably could incorporate one final bench. I'm not sure how the board feels, but I did, I do feel that it was an open enough area that you could do it without crowding the space. I would probably evenly get it on the kind of the opposite side of the, the half circle there. And I would request if we do move forward that the bench is kind of in kind to what exists for Nancy. I noticed as I went through and named all the benches that different people had different visions of what they wanted the benches to look like, different types of wood. Um, some were granite, some were wooden. And I would think just because of the way that the spot lays out and how it's a, kind of a focal point of the entire point down there, that they, they look similar. So. Um, here's a thought, because um, there are a lot of benches, as you just mentioned. Um, and we did lose our picnic table somewhere along the line. I'm not sure whether it was the the contractor that was doing the seawall or what happened, but I'm wondering if they would consider a memorial picnic table on that one location right at the corner there, you know, where it used to be, where there was a picnic table, if that's something they might consider. That's the area that, that Ruth has identified or it's a different area? No, it's a different area. You're looking at down by the, the new park. I'm looking at right up in here. Where the bush used to be. Yeah. Okay. Where it's, it's the widest part mm -hmm. of the, the park itself. Interest Interestingly enough, Peter, when I went down, I identified two spots, the one at the anchor, and I identified um, this as a potential spot, but I wasn't trying to crowd. But looking at the feet between benches, I actually did mark that. It wasn't a place of interest for her, but I would say that a picnic table could go there. I don't know that they want to do that, but I, right. I, I mean, would it say might be worth asking just because there is a lot, and if not, you've identified an area where we could put another bench in, but we should at some point um, decide that maybe we're at the limit for Right, benches. so uh, I think that's something that Ruth and I sort of uh, looked at decided when we were down on, there. that this was really pretty much the limit. The one, the one that's currently being requested and then this one additional one and that we should take some, some step what now whether it be a, a, a bench or a or a table table is is that's fine but that we make take st some step to make it clear that there if, if we grant the one uh, which is currently on the table that there is one space left and that we give everyone an opportunity if if they want to uh, memorialize you know be part of that uh, that they they put in their request and we give some period of time and then and then make a decision that was sort of the way I felt about it Ruth did you did that make sense to you yeah I mean I felt like the number of benches we have down there far exceed what we necessarily need but the request came to us I think it kind of opened our eyes to the fact that we do need to put a limit right I think given that it was requested and we did our due diligence to identify spots I would say for, from my point of view this would be the final one that I would Oh, I would so you wouldn't, you wouldn't go beyond that. I thought that we actually identified one other spot. We did. So if you want to take this map, we pointed out spots when we did the measurements, spots that a bench would fit. So right. the one down by the anchor was where we circled to the left of Nancy and said one was fit, would fit. But I think what Peter's saying is in the other one where I circled and wrote potential, that might be better suited as a picnic table. Mm -hmm. That was where the cars, cars kind of park and it overlooks the beach. Or we could allow a bench, but I think we need to put a cap where, wherever we need to be here. Well, I, I, I agree. So cap it at one more bench and maybe one, maybe picnic one table. more picnic table or maybe another picnic. It might be a nice spot to have a picnic table down where you're identified for the bench. I'm not as familiar with that site, but um, if, you, if you two determine that a bench yeah, I think should go there, we're, then we're that's, close to the limit. Right? That, yeah, I think we're close to the limit as well. And my only concern is that we, you know, in fairness, if, if we're going to establish this uh, cap, that we, we make it clear and anyone who has an interest in, in memorializing a loved one or whatever, that they be aware that, they're, that we're at oh, the limit. What, what criteria do we use to decide? 
it's always been somebody's approached the town. You've said, yeah, this looks like there's some space over there. Go and do it. So I guess my first question is, we do have one party that approached us for the one near the Gallant bench. Are you all agreed that that party should be allowed to go forward? Yes, okay. I am. Yeah. So yeah. I will entertain a motion to approve. And unless, well, wait a second, Ruth, unless you offer to them to do a picnic table, they may want to do that. Maybe they don't know that's an option to them. It certainly is going to be more expensive because the concrete pad that a picnic table would be on would be larger, but it's also more prominent and may have a lot more use. They may want to do that. So we can table this, bring it back at our next meeting, and in the meantime, we could reach out to... See which one they want. ...to Lee and Lane to see what she'd like to do. Yeah. And then bring it back. Yeah, and, and, I, and if they don't want to do it, we'll just go ahead with the bench. All right, I'll bring it back, and I'll get you that information. Thanks. Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't see the notice for that, but I did go down. I think I went down the same day, the same, probably the same time, within an hour of when you went. <laughs> Not a problem. So I noticed I skipped over the 133 sidewalk improvement proposal meeting that we right, had. But just to follow, the, to finish on that, I at least pr myself think that in addition to deciding on you know whether it's going to be a, a picnic table or a bench for for the current applicant if you will we ought to make clear one more after that after that and if you're interested you need right. to speak up and I think what what the chairman is looking to do is at the next meeting have that discussion and okay. and paint that picture whatever whatever it is you want to do okay yeah the I did skip over one item the route 133 sidewalk improvement proposal um, we did have a resident that um, had looked at sidewalks, particularly between Water Street and the Gloucester line, and worked with the senator's office to bring the, these issues to the attention of the Mass DOT. Fortunately, we had a meeting with that resident, with some other folks, with the senator's office, the representative's office. Fortunately, DOT has indicated that it is highly likely, although not a um, sure thing yet, that through a new DOT program, perhaps during calendar year 2023, there will be wholesale sidewalk improvement um, between Water Street and the Gloucester line. In addition, there may be either moving some crosswalks to better, safer locations or even actually uh, inserting some new crosswalks. So that was, that was great because we had an issue raised and then we had some good news come from the state agency that's charged with, uh, with dealing with those issues. I don't know if you have discussion on that. Is there a plan for uh, Gloucester to look at sidewalk from the- Yes, um, in fact, down? now we're basically on par with Gloucester because there was a transportation bond bill that first included Gloucester but no other KPN community. Another bond bill has now put similar language in for the other KPN communities, and that's why we're potentially going to see uh, the same thing. And we might actually move forward before Gloucester. I don't know for sure. And the reason I say this is their preliminary look is that there isn't a right-of-way problem with getting the new sidewalk through the corridor, whereas in Gloucester there may be other issues. Mm -hmm. So we've discussed the benches. We've talked about the elevator retro retrofit. We have a solution for that. We've talked about the school district budget collaboration meeting. Another thing that we did recently with DOT, another resident would like to see slower speed limits between the junction of, of uh, Southern Avenue and, and Main Street all the way out to roughly, I guess, Andrews or Kings, Kings Court, I think. Kings Court. The DOT did send some people out to look at this. Um, they said the only way that's going to change, because remember, there are special speed regulations in place in every town, including Essex, because we participate in the Chapter 90 road funding program, which brings state money to the, to the town to maintain roads. Um, so the DOT 
has to approve any changes to speed limits on these major roadways, Southern Ave being one of them. And what they said was it starts with the police department collecting speed data along certain segments of the road that we have in question. And then once that is collected, it can be analyzed by DOT to determine if perhaps speed limit decreases are in order. But before we do that, we're going to analyze the data internally because it's possible that the average speeds out there are actually higher than we think. And if that's the case, it might drive the speed limit up. So before any data gets turned over to the state, it will come to the selectmen and you can make a decision as to whether you want it analyzed further. That's where that stands right now. When's that going to happen? Uh, that is ongoing because it will take the police department probably a few different shifts. It's snapshots, I think, of, what, 120 observations, 200 observations? Something 200 like observations. At each vantage point. At each point. vantage po point, which were um, quarter-mile mile intervals, and they have to do 50 to 100 shots, radars, at each spot, and they have to clock it. So it's, it's an overtime thing. So I was... Right. As opposed to, you know, getting, paying overtime for someone to do this all at once, it'll be as... As, but uh, it's fallish as opposed to summer versus winter versus spring. So it, I, I uh, imagine it's it a would good change. time of year yeah. to do it, and they need to do it actually off peak. Yeah. Uh, so it's not morning rush or, or yeah. afternoon rush. Yeah. And they have all the. What's going on now, by the way, is the DOT is actually going to come up with some plans to show the police exactly where they should take the measurements. Because if it's left to us, there's a good possibility we'll take the data and turn it in and we'll be told by Boston that we took it in the wrong place. It's very technical. There's a whole manual on it. So we asked them to pr provide us with the areas they wanted us to work in. So do they, will people slow down because they see the police with their The police are gun? going to be in, <laughs> a, in an area, stealth area. They're going yeah. to be way off the road, not looking to pull anyone over, just collecting the data. Yeah. In the preferences that they will be in an unmarked vehicle. Yeah. We talked about the shared streets and spaces lighting grant, and we're, we're going to look toward zone two, but not 3A or 3B. In the near term, we've talked about the fall town meeting warrant. The Apple Street roadbed elevation uh, design project kickoff meeting. That is going to occur on November 2nd. It's going to be all virtual. We have now stood up a web page on the town website that provides information about the, the proposed project, about different meetings that are occurring earlier in the day that day. There will be a meeting that starts at the senior center and goes out to the causeway and then out to the project site because one requirement of the grant that's funding this work was that we include the major climate ch uh, challenge group in the town, which is the senior citizens of the town. So that's specific outreach and then that evening there'll be the the main uh meeting i'll try to attend the day and obviously the yeah the one. day is uh, 10 o'clock at the senior center and then 10 30 the group leaves for uh the field tour if we have more than one selectman attending is do we need to it's a site visit so that would be fine it's, it's not an issue in the meeting the the it's a zoom. virtual zoom meeting will be posted you'll for be that. posted for that okay. yeah And then finally, um, the board asked at the last meeting that I look at the earmark that has now been put aside, $30,000, to continue studying the Tobacco Lake and Alewife Brook ecosystem and issues such as proper drainage and proper Alewife fish passage. And specifically, we were trying to find out how long that money is available. Fortunately, we have uh, learned that the state will make that money available to be spent all the way through um, the end of fiscal year 2024, which is June 30th, 2024. So I think for Selectman Fippen, who you were talking about this at the last meeting, that points to perhaps send it, setting up long-term monitoring in a couple of strategic places yeah. rather than purchasing devices or whatever to do much more blanket monitoring. Probably water or water level, you know, surface water level loggers and maybe some groundwater level loggers. And so you might do maybe one at the edge of the lake, 
several in the stream and yeah. then a couple of groundwater. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if, if you want, I could get a proposal from Interfluve sure. as to what they would recommend based on the, the, the time horizon. Yeah. And yep. I'll bring and that the, back to the board. The funding amount. Yep. So is it possible we might get additional funding in the ne next fiscal year? We have not been alerted to that fact. I think okay. it's something they were able to get through in this package. Yeah. So right now, I think we're counting on the Which 30. Which was supposed to end uh, July 1st, 23? Actually, the money we got was supposed to run out. 22? In 22. But we, haven't e we hadn't even received the contract yet. And so obviously, they were going to extend it one year, but we got them to extend it okay, so an, an for two years. Okay, so an year. Yeah. yeah. And that's my report. Thank you, Brendan. I will entertain a motion to approve the weekly warrant in the amount of $137,158.26. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to exempt from Section 20 of Chapter 268A of the General Laws the contracts and amounts for the individuals listed contained within the 915-2022 warrant pursuant to subsection D of said section. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Peter, will you take the next one? Sure. Vote to exempt from Section 20 of Chapter 268A of the General Laws the contracts and amounts for the individuals listed below contained within the 922 2022 warrant pursuant to subsection D of said section. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I will be recusing. I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the Selectman's September 12th, 2022 open meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to ratify the chairman's signature of paperwork associated with the $50,000 legislative earmark to contribute toward the purchase and installation of decorative street lighting in downtown Essex and authorize the chairman to sign any future paperwork pertaining to said earmark. So moved. Second. All those in favor? This is, uh, would go towards the 97 or does it go towards no, the- No, this is, this is to do what we would call zone one. Okay. The 97 Part would be the, okay. the, the yeah, rest yeah. of the conduit installed yeah. area. Okay. Uh, aye. 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 And, aye. and the, oh, excuse me, the reason for that is the, the 50000 has to, the, the $160,000 grant doesn't actually include design money, and the, it also doesn't include police details. Okay. So we figure that by the time we, hopefully it will go partially towards, I, know, I see what you're saying, partially towards. Yeah. But the 97 includes its own allowance for police. Okay. I will entertain a motion to vote to accept a donation in the amount of $300 to the police department gift account. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We have correspondence from Michael March and Elizabeth Malin concerning the Allen property on Southern Avenue. I'm going to ask Town Administrator Zubricki to just give us... Um, kind of the, the history of the property and where we are today on that matter. Sure, so initially this property was the subject of litigation that the town was continuing to be engaged in. The site actually was a junkyard from many decades ago. There were many Board of Health orders and court orders with respect to cleanup of the site um, much of which was done. That left the condition of the, uh, the buildings. And even while the town had the, um, here you go, even though the town had the court case pending at the time, and the judge authorized the town to take down what's known as the garage building out front on Southern Avenue, the town declined to do that, and the town meeting actually provided $15,000 appropriation for that work. But the town declined to do that. Um, I don't, Peter, I don't know if you were involved at that point in time. I was. Uh, yeah. I don't think I was. So the court case needed to be dismissed. Um, the receiver for the court case that, that was in charge of the property, court-appointed receiver, had outstanding legal bills. The estate of William Allen 
had no way to pay those. And in order to resolve the litigation, um, the town paid $50,000, which town meeting uh, voted upon. Actually, no, the town paid that as a legal settlement. I, I recall that now. And the, the litigation was terminated, and it set up the parcel to become uh, simply another parcel in arrears for taxes like any other parcel in that status in the town of Essex. At that time, the town did not want to move forward with taking that building down, the garage building, and that's because anything that the town might do in the vicinity of that building or with respect to that building could mobilize contaminants or pollutants that were in the building because no one really knows for sure exactly what's stored in there. There's also a um, underground storage tank under one corner of that building, and if the building were to be taken down, it's possible that that tank, which no one knows the exact status of, could be damaged. Now, it's important to understand why the um, town wanted to um, get through the end of that litigation, close the litigation, and move toward the tax title process. That's the process where if a property owner hasn't paid the taxes, the town goes through the land court to actually take the property into the town's ownership. If you go through that process, it's the only way in Massachusetts to stay clear of any environmental issues that might be on that property. There could be things buried underground on the property. We've got the underground storage tank. There could be things stored in, in the buildings that are, dil are dilapidated. And the selectman at that time said, we absolutely do not want to have liability or culpability for any environmental issues that come out of this parcel when it perhaps goes into some form of reuse in the future. And if the tax title process is used and the town simply takes title and then auctions the property off, the town has no uh, liability in that uh, situation. We certainly wouldn't want somebody to buy the property at auction and then later, when they're perhaps having difficulty with contaminated materials or pollution on the property, come back and say, okay, I'm gonna help to abate that, but the town of Essex, you did some work on the property and you made the problem worse. The town does not want to be in that position. So that is why, even though the letter that we got says that the roof to the garage fell in recently, that is why the town still is not in a position to move, even if the building inspector, separately from the old court authorization, says it really needs to come down. The town is under no obligation via the Board of Selectmen to engage in that activity, to come up with additional money, to even utilize the appropriation that's already been set aside. Um, so even, even though town meeting did set aside money for that purpose, the selectmen have the ability to analyze it and weigh the benefit of taking that down versus the potential liability of what that might cause the town in the future. And that's why currently the town has not taken any action. And my understanding is that we're 10 to 12 weeks out on perhaps perfecting the tax title process. When we went into the COVID pandemic, all of the courts really crawled to a, to a halt and things are moving but very slowly and we're waiting for this parcel to have its literal day in land court. And then if the process gets perfected, there will be a chance for the town to have that auction. And then it will be up to a private individual to take the buildings down, clean up the site, et cetera. So when it reaches tax title status, it the town is no longer liable for any of the 21E. The, uh, yes, the only way to remain immune is to go through tax title, immediately auction it. Yep. And um, even though the town was an owner for a fleeting moment, the tax title process specifically exempts us from that type of liability. And that's the only way to yep. stay exempt. Yep. So I'd like to invite um, town accountant Jeff Soulard to the table. I met with Jeff on Friday and we discussed this property at length and it's important for the board to understand the one year wait process, Jeff, because although I was ready and gung ho after the 10 week wait process and it came into town ownership to, you know, forge ahead with the, the um, 
process of, of sending this to auction, Jeff clearly explained kind of where they stand on the treasurer collector slash accountant side of things. And I think that it's important for the board to understand that as well. Sure. So uh, as Brendan just mentioned, I think you know, that is the result of lots of talks with Copeland and Page over the years as our town council um, to you know, get through the tax title process uh, and immediately auction the process off. Typically, the process that t the treasurer will, f will follow is that you hold the property for one year to perfect the title. You hold the property for one year to perfect the title um, so that there's no claims against it. Um, when you think about the Allen property, uh, there's so much money owed that it's unlikely that we would have a problem because in order for someone to come and take buy that property back, they would need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but there is a potential that that could, you know, could be an issue that someone could watch work being done on the site and say, hey, you know what, I think now I'll exercise my right to buy that parcel for $190,000 and gum up the works and, you know, I, and, and try to... Um, you know, slow down the process and sort of get a payout would be my only concern. So what I said to Ruth the other day when we were talking with um, Brooke as well was, you know, as we get closer to finalizing these tax titles uh, is to maybe talk with Copelman and just, you know, make sure we have a good understanding of what would be our potential liabilities if we don't, you know, we know the risk of not waiting the year is the huge environmental issue, but what are, you know, how would we quantify what our risks are for not waiting the one year? Uh, I don't think that they would outweigh the, the environmental risks, but I think it's, you know, it's important that, you know, we understand that when we get to that point, you know. If we wait a year during that interim period, are we, sus are we li susceptible? I believe that would put us at risk. So if it, it might, and that's, that's why Jeff's saying we need to, once we get to that point, check in with council, get a new read on the whole thing, select and get your options, and then you, you decide, decide what, what to, to do. do yeah. but I just want to make sure that the board realizes that there are options that will be before us. At this point, I think that, um, in my opinion, it's a liability issue. I think it, it, it makes sense not to take on that huge potential liability to the town. God forbid that underground tank should leak. We don't know what's in there. We don't have a, a report from DEP. They haven't tested it, and we don't want to see that end up in the Great Marsh. So I think we leave things as is, get ownership, figure out our next step, and then proceed from there with as much information as we have. So I think at this point, we, yeah. I mean, I, my, my feeling is that we, do, we take no action. So you think tax title might be uh, accomplished by the end of the calendar year? So I'm going to have Jeff speak this? to that as well. So, um, as Brenda mentioned, um, all the courts, land court as well, slowed down during the pandemic. Uh, but land court has been uh, facing some structural challenges for a while. So, land court uses uh, internal uh, title examiners, uh, and then they use outsourced title examiners as well. So, there used to be, let's say, five internal, you know, court employees that served as land court. Uh, examiners, and they were the people that sort of controlled what came in, helped get it assigned out to the outside title examiners, and then they do the review when it comes back in. So they used to have five of those, now they have two. Um, and so they have these huge bottlenecks um, where, you know, the, like the, the case in particular, the, the property that has the barn on it, um, we've just asked our attorney to push for sort of some emergency, you know, kind of relief. Can they put this to the top of the pile? But the title exam on that particular property has been done for over a year. It's been sitting in a pile waiting to be, to be read. And they're just, you know, they're that far behind. I mean, we just, our attorney actually put through another sort of emergency um, request for a, a surrounding community that they've had things sitting in a pile for, you know, over two years. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a huge challenge there. Uh, and one of the issues I think we're going to face is we, you know, sort of in Essex always think of the Allen property as, you know, whatever it is, those four or five units on, on the corner of Southern Ave. But the reality is they are four or five different land court cases. Mm -hmm. Now we've just filed for this, you know, sort of emergency relief, which potentially would allow us to settle this particular property case in say 10 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. Um, but it doesn't settle the one next to it or the other adjacent one. So I think we've always thought, or I certainly did when I was treasurer of, you know, you're selling this as one strip of land, but it, we may be, things may get complicated for us if we get a judgment on this property and that you're determined that you don't want to hold it, you want to, you want to immediately sell it, you're going to be selling one of several units that 
you know, it's a different um, equation. Uh, everybody we know that's looking at it is looking at all these right. properties Buyers together. might not be interested if it's only a piece of it at once. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, we would still, you know, I mean, I think, again, we would talk to Kobelman, but I think we would probably have to entertain the idea of auctioning off this one property because we've got a judgment and we need to move forward. Um, but it may hinder um, what someone said, well, geez, what if I buy this, but I can't get the next one or, you know, it's, it, I mean, it could potentially be beneficial to us, right? Because if someone buys the first one, now you might get like bidding wars on the next one. Um, you know, uh, so it's going to come down to, you know, if we get an opinion from town council that we can continue to wait and still be immune, that's going to weigh on what the board decides to do, I'm sure. But I don't know what that's right. going to be. Yeah, so they, but they do tie together a little bit. But um, so, yeah, we're looking at, a, you know, an expedited time frame on this one uh, piece of property, which we, we hope to get. I mean, we've put in the request. We don't know if that will be uh, entertained or not. Um, but it doesn't necessarily answer, you know, the other properties that we have uh, in the queue there. And it would be uh, presumptuous of us to put in an emergency request because they're all contiguous. To yeah, we I mean, we are to some degree. Um, you know, uh, allowing our tax title attorney who spends a lot of time in that building, uh, you know, to determine, you know, how, how far to push that line. Uh, and I think in his judgment, this, you know, if there was really an, an actual sort of uh, physical uh, emergency on this one particular property, um, you know, now he may have offline discussions with this person and say, geez, you know, I don't mean to be a pain, but you know, could you do the other three yeah. while you're here? Um, so we'll see, and we'll keep you guys, uh, you know, apprised on, on how that moves through. Um, but yeah, we'll circle back once we have some answers on moving towards uh, an auction and get some final, you know, mainly, you know, especially for the treasurer's sake, um, you know, she wants to have something, you know, some backup because she would essentially be making a, a decision that might be against what you're sort of taught to do as the treasurer and you wouldn't want to, you know, be sitting in that chair if something went awry and then someone would come back and say, well, why, why did you make that decision? You know, you could be sitting there kind of alone uh, or whatever. So I think it's fair to the most fair to the treasurer to do that as well. Thank you, Jeff. Does anybody have questions for Jeff? No. Thank you so much. Sure. So I think my feeling at this point is that we take no further action. How does the board feel? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Thank you so much. I will... Next on our agenda is to consider a request from William Fippen a, for a resident parking sticker. And I will recuse myself from this discussion. Thank you, Peter. So this, uh, as the board knows, we looked at our resident parking sticker regulations recently. They were reviewed. They were, it was brought to the board from the town clerk, Pamela Thorne, who wanted to have very black and white guidelines around how to issue a resident parking sticker because there were a lot of people looking for multiples, people that didn't necessarily live in town, but they had second homes, so on and so forth. So we had her jot down what she'd like to see. It went to council for review. We firmed it up. And since that point, we've had requests from other people that owned properties in town that weren't necessarily residents. They may be a second home, vacation home. Um, and so I do have the letter before me from William Fippen, who writes, Dear Board of Selectmen, I'm one of the trustees of Lowe's Island Realty Trust, owner at one Low, Lowe's Island, also known as 27 John Wise Lane. I'm writing pursuant to Section 13 of the Town of Essex regulations for the issuance of a resident parking sticker, which allows the Board of Selectmen to grant relief to those who do not meet the criteria for issuance of a sticker. I do not meet the criteria and am requesting that you consider granting me relief. I was issued stickers in years prior to the adoption of the current regulations. I use those stickers solely for access to the town boat ramp at Main Street. The full extent of my use of the sticker was access to the ramp for launch, launching and loading my skiff a few times each season. My vehicle and trailer were present only for active loading and unloading and never parked at the boat ramp or any other place requiring a sticker. I would like to continue to use the Main Street boat ramp as described above. Lack of a sticker causes me so, some hardship. Under Section 13, I request that you allow a sticker to be issued to me. If that is not possible, I ask that you consider permitting me use of the boat ramp by some other means in your power. 
So I, I bring the board back to our June 6th, 2022 meeting, where we also received a letter from a Rockport resident, Joseph Parody, who owns four acres um, and has been paying property taxes for 22 years. At that point, uh, the board discussion back on June 6th, of 2022, was that we were going to, um, you know, stay with the parking regulations that we had recently adopted, and I, we denied the uh, the request for parking relief for a parking sticker relief. So that's just some history. Um, the request is before us. You know, taking taking any sort of a personal feeling out of the mix because of, of the last name, I, I mean, I, I think the board knows I try to treat everybody equally. And I, I'm pretty black and white. If we have policy and, and procedures and rules and regs, I follow them. So in my opinion, um, I would entertain a motion to deny the request to issue a resident parking sticker. Right, I would just comment, I, I, uh, I agree. I, I've often thought that the, mis the only mistake we made was to write into the process that we can make exceptions because I, it just doesn't seem to me that the, the, the exception process is, is, is viable because one exception becomes cause for another and, and so I would second and, and just also want to note that if we didn't have three marinas in town that allowed for launching um, you know I would say maybe we need to relook at the the, at the the regulations but we do have other options for launching you know people do launch down at Clamorous Beach they launch at the marinas they launch at Island Road so there are options um, some people that come before us actually even qualify for potential transfer station stickers. So, so that's my feeling on that. So I, um, sorry, so I entertain a motion to deny. Right. And you, you so moved, moved it in second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So, uh, next on the list is a discussion for the process of making appointments to the eventual convening of the new Affordable Housing Trust, now that the Affordable Housing Trust bylaw has been approved by the Office of the Attorney General. So that, that bylaw actually prescribed certain seats to be filled from sort, certain boards as well as a couple of at-large seats. And I know for the at-large seats, we, we have had a couple of official letters written in, people wrote in saying that they would like to be considered for those. So you may want to start with that part of the discussion. Um, one of the individuals is an attorney in town and specializes in property, that's John Guerin. And, and, and he was a former selectman, which is also a criteria that can be considered. And another uh, individual is Troy Scarborough. Troy is a banker that works with uh, affordable housing and putting together that type of deal on a daily basis. He has uh, uh, contributed to the Essex Housing Coalition, which was meeting uh, before the transition to this affordable housing trust. And I know that you have copies of those letters uh, before you. So I don't, I read the uh, Gearin letter um, a little while ago. I don't recall, did he, re he is a former selectman. Is he requesting to be an at-large or a former selectman? An at-large. At -large. At -large. Okay. I think they're one and the same, are, are they not? Oh, they're two, they're, two different they're things. They're two different things. And in, if you look at our, um, the Affordable Housing Trust, the CEO of the town actually has to be one of the seven trustees. Because if you read it, okay, so we'll just, just go through it. They are one and the same? Where do you see the... So I think when you look at the seven, um, one of the trustees must be a member of the board of select. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say former. So all the right. other ones are former, are current or former, except right. board of selectmen. But where you say former selectmen, that is a criteria that could be for one of the at large, right? Sure. But I, that, I that's what I'm getting at. It says, uh, right. But even if he wasn't a selectman, he would still be eligible as a at large. Correct. As at large, he has the he has the for, work for, experience yeah. and the background credentials. Exactly. Yeah. So I think he's eligible two ways for that seat. But what would we want him as? Is it easier to 
to solicit a former selectman or easy to solicit an at-large with credentials? No, the, well, there's no seat so for a former selectman. See, oh, it says an, okay. an at-large member may also be any former member of the board oh, of selectmen. Oh, okay. So he qualifies gotcha. in a, as an at-large okay. member two ways. Yes. That's what I was getting at. Okay, I see. And we don't need to solicit him. He's actually sent in a letter of interest. Right. He's, he and Troy are both interested in taking those two at-large seats. Um, what has the process been? I mean, you mentioned to, to Ben to try to see if you could get somebody from the finance committee has any other um, of these boards or committees been contacted? Yet? No. Um, so we wanted to have a, an initial discussion tonight since the yeah. bylaw has now yep. officially come into yep. being. So if you want, since we know we're going back to the finance committee, I could talk to the chairs of the other boards and see if we get recommendations. Yeah. Do we, I feel comfortable with both of the uh, applicants for the at-large positions I do as well yeah I I agree and the rest are some sort of have some sort of official town capacity that's right so, yeah so do you want to bring it back and you could appoint those two individuals plus the recommended slate of people all at once why don't I have them before us tonight and we're discussing it why don't I entertain a motion to appoint Troy Scarborough and John Guerin as our, our at-large members of the Affordable Housing Trust. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, because there's a phasing in. Yep. Yeah. Two years. except the three of the initial uh, trustee appointments shall be for a term of one year. I mean, yeah, well, it says three of them shall be for one year, which would mean four of them would be for two years. I, I'm going to suggest that since the selectmen are always going to have somebody on it, even if that's one of the one-year ones, it's going to get renewed. These two people have... Um, quite a bit of background and for continuity's sake i think they're going to be actually helping to drive the the business of the board i i would recommend that those those two, two are for for two years right it's either one or two either trustee shall serve term of two years except yeah three of them need to be a one-year term three or one year everybody else is two so, so i would recommend two years because these candidates are highly qualified yep Fine. Okay. All right, I'll let them know and then I'll get the other boards. Perfect. Um, we have a request to consider granting permission to Cottage Park Realty Inc. to conduct an in kind maintenance of the seawall at 155 Canoma Point Road, Map 108, Lot 40, set activity to proceed under the auspices of Chapter 91, License 5650. So, What is the maintenance? Uh, I spoke with the with the tenant. Um, George Emerson represents the Cottage Park Realty yep. Trust. Um, he indicated that the current seawall is actually starting to slump over. A lot of the stones have now fallen out into the resource area. I can tell you the, a brief history here. The DEP. Department of Environmental Protection in 1994, I believe it was, came out and said, look, people need to have Chapter 91 waterways licenses for things like seawalls and docks, piers, things like that. They issued a period of amnesty for people to come out and say, okay, I don't have a license now, but I want to become licensed. At that time, remember, we were actively leasing these parcels along the waterfront and the tenant said, okay, fine, we'll sign up and we'll get our amnesty licenses. At, the, at that point in time, the selectmen, who were the Canoma Point commissioners at the time, decided that they wanted to have the Canoma Point, um, the, the new Chapter, one, Chapter 91 amnesty licenses at Canoma Point issued in the name of the town with the rights of the tenants to do the maintenance. And that's what ended up happening. And there was litigation 
but at the end of the day, these Chapter 91 licenses, including the one for this parcel, were issued in the name of the town. So the selectmen would just simply be allowing this tenant to exercise the rights of repair maintenance under that Chapter 91 license. And I put together a uh, possible motion that would uh, stipulate the terms. And it's all going to be stone replacement, which is there now. Not yes, not because concrete. if the tenant wanted to change the form of the wall, that would not actually be under the right. maintenance allowance of the existing license. And everybody saw the point. The, yeah. Okay. I, Ruth Perrine, move that the Board of Selectmen, in its capacity as Kenoma Point Commissioners, approve Cottage Park Realty Inc.'s request to perform maintenance on the seawall at 155 Kenoma Point Road, Map 108, Lot 40, subject to all terms and conditions of the land lease for said premises, including but not limited to Articles 5 and 9, and subject to the terms of the Town of Essex Chapter 91 License 5650, dated June 12, 1996, any proposal differing from in-kind maintenance to the existing style, layout, or dimensions of the seawall and its associated backfill area must be specifically brought before the commissioners for further consideration, and this approval is contingent upon the leasee securing any and all other necessary local, state, and federal permits. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 The, the next is nominations for employee and volunteer of the year, and um, I issued that call as I do every year for nominations. Um, this year, we received just one nomination, and that's for employee of the year. We received no nominations for volunteer of the year. I think we had the opposite happen in a previous year where we got one for volunteer, but none for employee or something like that. So we, we don't generally ish, uh, talk about the names um, at this point because it's a surprise when the award is, uh, is granted, which happens at the fall town meeting. There's really nothing to discuss. We only have one and I'm thrilled with it. So. Yes, I am too. <laughs> Great, so I'll move forward with uh, setting up that award. And we'll leave the volunteer alone. Yeah, maybe there'll be one for next year. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to take this all as one motion. Um, I will entertain a motion to sign the cover letters offering leases of the Northern Conoma Point, Robbins Island, and Beach Circles as follows, Assessor's Map 108, to be reconfigured in accordance with Conoma Point Commissioner's revised leasehold maps as listed below on page three. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, items that could not reasonably an be anticipated, Brendan, if you could. Yeah, I have, I have one item. Um, it's come to our attention, and this has been discussed in the past, that um, th at the Great Marsh Brewery, I think it was over the weekend, there were people, again, congregating on the fire escape stairs with alcohol. Um, this was specifically disallowed in the conversation that was had at the public hearing, and it was put in writing. And in fact, uh, when we saw this occur at one point in time, I brought it to the attention of the proprietor of Great Marsh Brewery, and he indicated it wouldn't happen again, the staff would make sure of it, et cetera. Well, it happened again, and my question is whether the board would like to convene uh, a hearing on this matter at some future time. So um, we were very specific in our motion to approve the license that um, based on the feedback we got from our building inspector as well as the fire chief, that that is strictly a fire egress and that no one is supposed to be on that fire escape. Um, it was brought to his attention in subsequent meetings it was acknowledged, and I mean, I, I feel like the only way to have 
people holding an alcohol license take the licensing board seriously is to hold them accountable when they violate the terms of their license agreement with this town and this board. So I am in favor of convening a hearing. Was it um, documented uh, with uh, photographs? Photographically. Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. So it's not just hearsay. I agree. I agree. Um, so when would you like to consider that? I think we can't turn it around in a week, so it would have to be the second meeting in October. I'm fine with that. 24th. The 24th of October. And, I, and we would, I believe, notify the manager of record and we'll copy the owner of the establishment. That's correct. Thank you. And just what are, what are our possible actions that can come out of the review? The town's local regulations for um, local licensing of alcohol, uh, I believe there's a, a chart in there that talks about first offense, second offense, et cetera. So I'll, I'll uh, send that out as a refresher. Right. So next on our agenda is um, Centennial Grove Rental. This is an event um, that takes place in Essex annually. The item reads, Ales over ALS, Nathan Woodman for use on Saturday, November 5th, 2022, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. That is strictly for the rental of the Grove House. The house. The, the cottage, the Grove Cottage. And I'm gonna take this, these together. Um, so I'll entertain a motion. There, there's some language that we need in here. So I have the Centennial Grove regulations dated May 2nd, 2016. And I just wanna make sure we capture all of this as we did last year when we approved this. Um, so I'm gonna read last year's motion to make sure we capture it. So I, I will entertain a motion to approve Nathan Woodman using the Centennial Grove rental between the hours of 1 p.m. and 9 p.m. on November 5th, 2022 provided that he issues the town a new certificate of liability naming the town of Essex as the additional insured, making sure that he rents porta potties. Number six talks about having no fires without a permit. I wanna make sure that's stipulated in the approval. And also ask that. What is the geography of the rental? I mean, does it include the beach? Does it include over where the pill? I'm, no, I'm it's you're, you're renting the, the cottage and it's immediate environs. So there's no parking over by where you normally would park by the beach and all they that. They do park the, there and down by the baseball I'm fields. just concerned if, if in fact the pavilion is under construction as far as putting it, footings in. It won't be in under construction that sort of at stuff? that point. Okay. No, not, even, not even concrete work? It doesn't sound like it. Okay. We're still waiting to determine what the floor plan is going to be, yeah. meaning what we're going to be yeah. using so for materials. Be I don't think that that'll be a conflict. Did, did the so you've asked for a, a additional insured uh, to their that's actually box. but did, did we do we ask for any sort of indemnification or hold harmless? Yeah, they have to get a million dollar uh, insurance policy for the day and we get named as an additional insured they have to correct that because they only gave us a, uh, they only gave, put us down as a certificate holder so we already have the million dollar policy guy it's actually right here but they named it as the lake house at centennial grove and our regulations and the town needs to be named as the additional insured for a million dollars so i just need that corrected as part of this motion um, so I, I, well, I just would say a million dollars is nice, but wouldn't we also, beyond the limits of the policy, want to be held harmless and get an indemnification from them? Pam, I don't, I don't think we've ever, do we use a form like that? Yes, we do. Yeah, so there is, there is a form in addition yeah, to I, the policy. That would be necessary. All right, here it is. Great. 
So I assume this was drafted by council. Yeah, it was a number of years ago, though. Yeah. Oh. So I will entertain a motion to approve the rental for November 5th, 2022, between the hours of 1 and 9 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Next is a one-day wine and malt. That is also for Ales over ALS, Nathan Woodman, for use on Saturday, November 5th, 2022, between the hours of 1 and 9 p.m. within the confines of Centennial Grove. So our one-day wine and malt stip, um, regulations before me also require that they hire police detail. So that'll be part of the motion. They did hire police detail last year. They, only, they did only hire the police detail from 3 to 8 p.m., yet their approval was from 1 to 9, and the intent is supposed to be that while people are consuming alcohol that there is a police presence. So I will entertain the motion to approve the one-day wine and malt, provided that the two detail officers are there for the entire duration of the event from 1 to 9 p.m. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, we have a one-day entertainment license before us for this particular um, event as well. It's Ales over ALS, Nathan Woodman, for use on Saturday, November 5th, 2022, between the hours of 1 and 9 p.m. within the confines of Centennial Grove Outdoor Amplified Music and Announcements. So I go back to um, last year. As part of our motion, we had asked, the board had asked Mr. Woodman to keep the volume to a respectful lev level to the neighbors. That was back at our meeting on October 18th of 2021. After the event, I did hear some people um, concerned that the music was loud and far reaching beyond the property limits. So I would just stress that, um, that last year's event went fairly well. Was it live or recorded? Um, last year, he says, one day entertainment, ALS over ALS, one to 8 p.m. within the confines of Centennial Grove, live band with amplifier and speakers. Board asked Mr. Woodman to keep the volume to a respectful level of neighbors. Yeah. So that was a live band. He does not mention a live band this year. This year, he simply says um, outdoor amplified music and announcements. So as the board knows, I have been holding firm to the policy. Um, that we unanimously voted for in regards to outdoor amplified music. However, last year I did vote in favor of this event as it is only held once a year. And it is a community event where all are invited. It's completely inclusive and it's a fundraising event. So I will entertain a motion to approve the Ales over ALS one day entertainment on November 5th between the hours of one and 9 p.m for outdoor amplified music and announcements with the volume staying to a respectful level of the neighbors. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, under the uh, one-day entertainment licenses, we have the Rivers Bend at Essex Marina before us, uh, Lindsay Bergeron, for use on Sunday, October 2nd, 2022, between the hours of 12 noon and 1 p.m. on the lawn at 35 Dodge Street, mic eulogy and remembrance speeches, song via Bluetooth speaker. So this is um, mimicking what has been approved, um, I think, successfully during the course of 2021 and 2022 to this point. Um, it does go against some of our policy, but it is before us, so I'll entertain a motion to approve the one-day outdoor entertainment license on Sunday, October 2nd, 2022, between the hours of 12 noon and 1. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm going to abstain. Reminders, if the board could take out their calendars, we have reminders this evening that are gonna require board participation. Like the selectmen meeting? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first reminder is that our next regular board of selectmen's meeting is gonna be Monday, October 3rd at 6 p.m. right here on the third floor. So hopefully everyone can attend. Next is 
just a reminder that we have the strategic planning committee to hold the virtual public forum regarding its draft update of the Essex strategic plan on Thursday, October 6th, 2022 at 7 PM. You'll be posted that we will be posted. And there's also the, um, the forum that will, that our town administrator so graciously is going to give at the senior center in all are welcome to that as well. He does that so that the seniors that don't drive have the ability to have the same, um, presentation as everybody else that will be at the forum that evening as we know a lot of our seniors do not deal with technology in any capacity and a lot of them don't drive and can't get to the town hall in the evening so thank you for doing that brendan um, next is where we need calendars wednesday october 12 2022 ripple on the water essex division cape ann chamber of commerce small business person of the year award from 5 to 7 p.m this is going to be the presentation um, of the whereas proclamation to arlene talia doris for her small business person of the year and I just wanted to give the entire board an opportunity to be there to present. Um, if multiple of us want to go, we're certainly, we can, we can go as well. So you'd like to know if we're. If somebody wants to present the award, I want to, we, we're going to get back to them to let them know which selectmen will be presenting. And if there are more than one of us that are available that evening, we can certainly all go to the event. I'm not sure if I'll be able to make it or not. I will okay. try. Guy, do you have a yeah, desire? Uh, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Do you want to present or just be present? Would you I, like I, me to present? I'd really rather not. But <laughs> okay, so I will present on October 12th. And Guy, if you'd like to join me just for a show of support, that would be great. Um, Friday, October 21st, the Greater Cape Ann Chamber Caucus will be at 1145 in, at the Ipswich Town Hall, 25 Green Street. I am not sure I can make this. Peter, I think you had mentioned that you were going. Is that um, true? I, I'm going to be out of state then. Okay. And while I'm at it, I'm coming back on the 24th. Hopefully, I'll be back in time for the meeting on the 24th. Okay. Guy, how is your availability on the 21st? And Brendan, I know that you will be present. Yeah, I'll be there. Yeah, that, I'll do a yes. Okay, I will try to be there. I'm not sure I can be. Essex Division um, of the Greater Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce. Uh, this meeting. is the one I, th I thought I could be at. You could be yeah. at this one. Okay, yeah. so this is Wednesday, October 26th at 8 a.m. at Essex Seafood. Yep. Perfect. And Guy, you, you're welcome to go to that if you like. I probably will not. Then. Okay. Wednesday, November 2nd at 10 a.m. is the um, Apple Street presentation at the Senior Center. Yep. Wednesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m. is going to be our virtual forum. That is all. Does the board have any more questions, comments, concerns before I open it up to public comment? No. Um, did you want to go back and revisit climate futures, or do you want to table that to a another we'll table meeting? It. Okay. I think we should just table it. Okay. So on the line with us this evening, I it appears as if I have two residents. Do either of the residents joining us via technology this evening have any public comment? Okay, hearing no public comment on the line, I'm gonna open up public comment in the room. Is there anyone here this evening that has public comment? Shelly, if you'd like to join us at the end of the table and speak into the microphone, that would be great. Hi, my name is Shelly Bradbury at 79 Eastern Avenue. Um, my question is regarding the Allen's property. Um, just from your description that there's a tank that we don't know what's in it, that the garage is getting ready to fall. If it does break the container, then what is the obligation of the town to do anything and how do we know? And is it a possibility? Because it's sort of, I feel urgent that, that can we ask the DEP to do testing just to see what's in it and if the container is solid Thank you. So the town has no ownership interest whatsoever in, in the property. Uh, so presently, it's just like any other property where the owner would be responsible for anything that happened on the property. The way back when we were looking at the possibility of taking the garage down, 
I actually had somebody from DEP out at the site and I had somebody from EPA out at the site because they both offer grant programs that will help clean up sites like this. And specifically with respect to the garage, neither one of them encouraged me to apply because there's no way to understand what the variables are until you actually get in there. And nobody was willing to go in there because as you know, the roof just fell in. I mean, you could open the door and the roof could fall on, fall on you. Um, and then also, uh, if you get started with it and then you start taking it apart and you find that there's something that's been stored in there for decades, it could, it could change the whole outlook on, on the site. And so neither DEP nor EPA was willing to help because there's no way to even understand what the, what the issue is. It's that complicated. So if it, let's just say it does leak out, we don't know that until it starts to affect the fish life or bird life. That would be correct. Then that's when, will the town take action then? Or what, what is, what do you do? Like, it just seems so. You have, a, a you have an estate right now that my understanding is there isn't any money in the estate to help with these issues anyway. So I'm not sure what the town would do, even if you saw contamination. Um, that's a hypothetical. It's hard to, hard to answer a question like that, but right. you know, the, the, the board- the state might get involved or the if, federal if government If it went from, involved. we think this stuff in the ground to we're seeing a signal in the, in the river, yeah, you know, that might change their tune. Okay. Um, especially when we're talking about the site in general contributing to pollution in the area versus that garage. And that right now, that's the specific question that was asked. Will the town jump in and be involved with that garage? And the answer is no. You heard it from the selectmen because there's too much at stake. Okay, thank you. So I take it there's no, no coverage under our liability policy for fines or penalties or... We don't, we don't own the property. We have no liability or culpability for that property whatsoever. Nina. Hi. That seems very formal. Um, Nina McKinnon, One Lowland Farm Road. Um, I am a member of the Finance Committee. I figured that needs to be disclosed, but my views tonight are mine alone. I'm not here as a representative of the Finance Committee. Before I actually go specific, even though it has to do with Apple Street, I did want to just mention with the reminders you just listed, it did seem interesting that the October 4th meeting with the Essex Council of Aging specific to Apple Street wasn't mentioned. And I guess that could then lead into just sort of what I had written down. Let's try to understand this. I don't think there is an October 4th meeting with... The Essex this. Council of Aging on the website, it says there's an October 4th meeting. That, I don't think that has to do with Apple. Isn't that the strategic plan? That's the strategic plan. Um, and I think, yeah. If I, town administrator views previews the project, Apple Street, with the Essex Council on Aging at 6 p.m., Essex Senior Center, 17 Pickering Street. Hmm. I'll have to check in on that, because we have a specific thing set up with the Council on Aging Director for November 2nd, where I'm... Yeah. And that's listed. I'm just, I'm just looking. So I'm going to do a presentation there, and then we're going to do the field visit. So you're saying there's something... typo oh that's with the council on aging yeah that's what oh, oh i, I yeah I now i now i see the confusion yeah. i thought you were talking about the presentation that i'm going to give to anyone that wants to come and ha and hear the presentation so does that mean the october 4th meeting i know this isn't really for dialogue isn't open to the no that's a public that's a public meeting okay. But not specific then to the board of selectmen so that's why it wasn't listed on the reminders right okay. because it's just a here I am, and this is, you know, what we're going to start talking about, because in the grant application, we mentioned that we would stay in touch with the council, with the director, and with the seniors themselves through, through different things that will happen throughout the project. Um, so in terms of just some things I'd written down so I stay on track, um, specific to Apple Street and in general, I really would say, and it's something that you all know, that I think trust is built by communication 
and it's just such a key piece. You could say communication builds trust. Well, I'm thankful that there is this new information on the Town of Essex website, the calendar, the way for people to give their feedback. It does create the question for me, why wasn't this done earlier? In review of the 2018 Essex Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Report, the need for emergency access is addressed. Page 24 listed Rocky Point as a consideration. What further work was done to evaluate this option? Where is this report? What public discussions took place in 2018? In 2019. Do, do you want answers to these? Because we I need don't to. I know if I'm allowed to have dialogue from other. I, I don't know what you want to do because I. <laughs> you can I won't remember all your questions. Oh, no, yeah, no, let's do these one at a time, yeah, Nina. So okay. let BZ answer if he has the yeah, answers yeah, yeah. for you. So what was the first question? Um, just how in the 2018 report it did list that Rocky Point could be seen as a consideration. So it was just sort of what further work was Rocky done. Hill Road, maybe? Road. I'm sorry, Rocky okay. Road. Uh, what further work was done to evaluate this option, and then where would that information be found if someone wanted to see that it was fully vetted up? Um, it may have been brought up, but the ownership of that area all the way through is contested and controversial, and it's not known as a, an approved public road at all. In fact, a lot of it is dirt road, I believe. And so even though someone would have brought it up, it's not, in, in my opinion, a, a viable alternative. Doesn't Mac own some chunks of that? Manchester, Essex? Yeah, and road. there's gates there with disputes over who controls the gates. And again, it's not suitable for, for, uh, for traffic, especially in a, in a disaster where it could be rain and mud. And, Okay, so. And so in 2019, the town of Essex, the hazard mitigation report for page one, on page 123 lists that the design and construction was in the um, estimation of a million dollars. So that's just a statement based on what. Yeah, that was something that someone did a, a quick call and on, yeah. So then in March 2020, certainly we all know the world stopped with COVID hitting. So the 2021 project feasibility report was formally titled the elevation of Apple Street for alternative transportation and it presents the current information that is now being evaluated. However, the current report is now titled final Apple Street roadbed elevation and culvert replacement. What public meetings were held to notify the public of this change in title, the change in scope. Where, where are you getting final? It's what it says on the report. Like, on the website. What report in 2019? 2021. Sorry, 2021. No, no, no. We're yeah. calling it the Apple Street Roadbed Elevation and Culvert Replacement Project. In 2021, it was just referred to as Elevation of Apple Street, so the culvert wasn't in the title. Um, so it wasn't in the title, but it's we actually started this whole thing with a DER culvert grant. The culvert was first. Okay. It just so it just saying so that's where it just goes. It seems like. You know, it seems like we have 2018, 2019, obviously COVID stops, and now we're at 2022. I was clearly not as involved. Yeah, so I can explain all that. So we've had three grants up until this point. We're on our fourth grant. Two of the grants were Department of, uh, what is it? Division of uh, Environmental ecological, Restoration, ecological. Eco Ecological Restoration. And those are specific to um, stream crossing barriers and making sure that the um, ecology on one side of the road has the correct transition to the other side. And, and sometimes the road actually breaks them into two separate and very disjunct environments. And so we did that one. And even during, even during that grant, for the first DER grant, we talked about the concept of raising the road. We then went to try to get money the next year to do the next piece because the first one was mostly field data gathering it really didn't get into much design. Um, and when we did that, we were not successful for that second application. But we were successful in the CZM grant to start studying the dip in the road that didn't have the culvert, because there are two dips in the, in the road. The year after that, we tried again for trying to catch up the area with the culvert for getting some actual design work done, and we were successful. So that's how we, those three things happen. But all three of them have always talked about both the culvert needing to be replaced and elevating the road because of the, the causeway situation. So your question has to do with why are we starting to take input now? 
And that's because now we're actually embarking upon bringing both dips in the road into a common design project together because they, they were always separate. DER only wanted to deal with the part of the road that had the culvert and CZM was helping us explore for the first time the part of the road beyond that that doesn't have the culvert. The whole goal of the MVP grant, which is what we have before us now, was to unify both sections of the road, both dips in the road, so that they can be studied all at once and a design can be advanced that will handle the whole thing, including the permitting that's necessary for it all. And now that we're talking about the thing as a whole and we've gotten beyond basic feasibility, it's time to start taking um, people's input and viewpoint because there still is a chance to work with this design that's gonna come out for this whole thing, which is the 800 feet of roadway. Thank you. Sure. And I think part of it, because I sort of feel I understand what you just said, but with all the various acronyms, various grants, you can see where people might feel there's not, um, it's just not a cohesive understanding. If I do speak to being on the FinCom in March of 2020, I know it was downstairs where we did speak about the $80,000 transfer for Article 30. Yeah. And that was, to be honest, my first time hearing about the project. I wasn't in the FinCom back in 2018 or 2019. And my recollection was the 80,000 was for design and evaluation. It was not for permitting. So that's my fault that I didn't look back at it. But I can do remember that costs were vaguely mentioned in the $1 million range for one section of Apple Street. And now six months later, it's the two sections, 800 feet, as you just mentioned. And the cost from a meeting I heard over the summer is that we're getting into the $4 million range. Absolutely. By the time we get there, which is two years from now, if we get permitted and this all goes through, yeah, it's going to be. And I know you're going for the grant, so I'm not, I'm not saying. Yeah, we're going to go for 90% federal funding and trying to get the other 10% paid for by the state. So I guess I would just sort of look at that we know climate is changing. We know the causeway floods. I'm not a scientist or a roadway engineer. Apple Street floods when the causeway seriously floods. This happens when there's a new moon, a full moon, high tide, and a serious storm. We know the lunar calendar. We know the tide charts well into the future. So if we keep it really simple, it can flood two times a day, 20, two times within 24 days out of 365 days. The last time it flooded was March of 2018, which is approximately 1,460 days ago. So the questions the BOS, or the board selectmen, excuse me, would be if there were no matching funds, if we don't get the 10%, would we be moving ahead with this project? My other question would be, is the town addressing public safety? Apple Street is used by many in the community. How is the town going to address the additional needs of the community for the additional road use? The potential lawsuits based on increased chance of accidents. As it currently stands, the town is not adequately able to monitor this road. Costs are always a consideration, and we know there will be higher speeds just based on the nature of it being wider. Apple Street ices at certain sections along its entirety a lot more frequently than it floods. What's the plan for Apple Street to always be clear of any hazard and at what cost to the town, to the environment? As I stated in the August meeting when I last spoke, it's just the sense of the community feeling, or the board selectman feeling that the community really understands what is taking place. Article 30 almost feels like it's a, a pass for construction to begin not just that we're evaluating our options. Well, the board will have to comment on whether they would do it in the absence of funding. And then if you ask those other questions again, I can answer all of them. Yeah, I can tell them to you. I'm happy to speak to this a little bit. Um, I've had individual conversations, Nina, with yourself, with Janet Carlson, with Shelley Bradbury, and many others in the community that reach out to me. And I myself have made it very clear that when I got elected to this position, I was elected, I mean, I would like to say by the entire community, but we know that's not entirely true because we know that we don't have that number of voters that come out. But when I make decisions at this table, I think about 3,675 people every time I sit here. I'm not gonna say that every one of those 3,675 people is happy with the decision I make or the, the vote that I, you know, the motion I throw on the table or the, the decisions I make. However, you know, there's an old saying, when seconds count. And there are two things that I think about 
situations that pop in my head when I think about this particular situation. My husband, full disclosure, captain on the fire department, been on the department for 30 years. I hear a lot of calls. My scanner is always on. And the need for police and fire on the other side of the causeway is a huge consideration. Um, we had, back in April of this year, as probably everyone knows, we had a resident who very unfortunately caught on fire. And when he dialed 911, he was astounded at how fast our first responders were there to take care of him. That was a fire call and a medical emergency. When we had somebody um, you know, have a heart attack on Lufkin Street, not that long ago. It's amazing how fast our emergency response was there. If we have to leave the town of Essex through Hamilton or Beverly and get on 128 to come down School Street to approach the residents that live on the other side of town, I mean, it's not fair. And I think from my own perspective, I have to think about the people that live beyond the causeway and beyond Apple Street. So anybody on Southern Ave, you know, Eastern Ave, Canomo Point, they are being considered when I, when I take a vote. So as of this minute, I do support this project. Am I willing to look at all aspects, design, make sure that it, you know, it's, it's amenable to the members of the community? Yeah, we want to look at it. We want to see what our engineers bring before us. Will I be voting in favor of this project? I will be. I will be because I firmly believe that every resident in this community has the right to public safety. They all pay taxes, the same as people that live on Lowland Farm and Apple Street and Turtleback. And they are entitled to our public safety as is everybody else. So that's where I stand on this project. And I don't think, I, I speak for certainly myself, I would hope everyone here, I in no way would want anyone to have a public a safety issue at all. And I should have said that in front. I guess the concern would be if I, and I think you and I have worked together of staying objective, it seems like we only have the four options of consideration. It seems like whatever these feasibility things I've just read to keep speaking about alternative one, two, three, and four. I know the tech, whatever that acronym stands for, is recommending -E number three. TEC is recommending number three. So it's where are the other options that might be the temporary bridge. It might be having what is the cost to have because we, again, know when the storms are. We could have those emergency vehicles, let's say, parked in the parking lot of Blue Marlin. It's just, again, knowing that we are considering other options. We're not just keep seeing these reports that say one, two, three, and four. It's just knowing that all of that's looked at so that the whole town, I would think no one is wanting anyone to be unsafe. I know I certainly would not want anyone to be unsafe in this town. And I would want to make sure that's clear, not taking out context. I also want to comment that um, sea level rise, storm surge, um, you gave some figures for currently the situation and there's been a lot of study on Essex and throughout New England and certainly Massachusetts on predictions for the future and things are only going to get higher and higher and more frequent. So, you know, we're not designing for today's situation of whatever it was 1000 and something days since the la it last occurred, but for what the future brings and you know, we're following the current science, and that's what's driving us towards this as well. Right, and I think it's important to add, too, that the predictions are not only that it's going to get worse and worse, but on an exponential basis. So right now, it, it, it could start to go up a little bit, but when we hit a certain point, the prediction is it's going to go like that, yeah, which means all of a sudden right. you don't have what you were describing. You have a much more frequent problem. I, I would concur with that. I would also point out, I think, something that Brendan had mentioned is that we are just, again, on the, ups, the uptake on this, and it's, a, it's an opportunity uh, for getting these, th these funds, uh, these grants approved, because we're a, a little bit ahead of the game. And if, if, we, if we wait, then the, uh, the, the, those opportunities might not be as apparent. And, and on that note, I, I can tell you that there's great interest in this project from the people at MEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, um, because it represents, and other state agencies, because it represents one of the first projects in the Commonwealth where a town is looking at potentially a form of retreat from the coast. And that's because 
it would be money put into an alternate travel path that's not right on the coast. And I think that once a few of those projects gets get done, the um, the willingness or the the energy behind funding them might not be as robust. Right now, we have a chance to get on that 90% federal funding waiting list, and we have a whole host of characters who are looking to help usher this project through. We even got access for this grant application. If you've looked at the application, which is on the website, we even got access, direct access to MEMA's own technical consultant for uh, climate change and sea level rise. And they actually helped run the calcs and the graphics that went into the grant application. That's how interested people are in this, in this project. I'm not saying that's the only reason to do the project. I'm saying that if you're gonna do the project anyway, you might as well put your best foot forward and get in the funding game before someone else steals your thunder. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I totally agree, and I know there's other people, and it's a late night. I think it would just, it would just feel so good to think there could be an option five at this point in time, because basically the report we're looking at is from a, a, the 2021 report. And I guess just thinking of the public input again, options that create safety, no one is taking away that. And just sort of what are, what are the choices? Because Apple Street will become more unsafe the other 340 days of the year. Well, let me comment on that. So right now you can drive down Apple Street if there's no water covering the road, right? So just because the first 800 feet perhaps is, is improved or is, is raised, Will that necessarily put additional people down Apple Street, or are they going to drive around if they already drive around? I wouldn't be able to say that, but Apple Street right now is a cut through because of the causeway. So the only benefit to the construction is maybe people won't remember to use um, Apple Street. But with the causeway debacle, people use Apple Street a lot. If you've ever gone. But they're doing that now, what I'm saying, without any roadbed elevation or changes to Apple Street, they're making choices to use Apple Street. But they're doing it because of the causeway, but they're also using Apple Street as a way to, like, they use it as a way to bypass the police who sit on Causeway oh, Street when it's... Right, but they're doing that, that, they're doing that now. So why would this project make the choice of going down Apple Street more popular? Because you could say that some people would think it's wider, therefore it might seem less dangerous, except it's going to widen and then get tight again at the top of right, the... Right, and I think that people, people who are testing that theory will probably go down at once. They'll see that the improvement ends after 800 feet, and they're, not, they're either gonna be a person who wants to take the windy path, which you can do now, right, or not. I don't, my position on that is I don't think the 800 feet is gonna entice new people to take the windy path. I don't know, <laughs> like that, thank you. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> Just tell us your name and your address because we don't know you. So Paul Turnby, 56 Apple Street. Um, been, a res been renting for uh, a decade now and just bought two years ago there. Um, I've been a long time walker, runner, and cyclist on the road. And um, I just would move you to consider um, the Department of Transportation as well as Massachusetts Highway Division of Traffic, uh, their calming toolkit. And just take a look at some of those when considering some of the design trades on the road. Because right now the consideration was to widen it 20 feet with some additional buffers on the side. Effectively, to widen it by two feet. Widen it to 20 feet, that's correct, yes. Um, and then bring it out to a total width of 31 feet for the leveled portion of the road. That's what's in the TEC plans. Um, sure, but the traveled surface is going to be 18 feet wide now, correct. and a car will only be able to go on a 20-foot road after. The corridor might be changing, because if you come up in some places four, five, six feet, you have to have the, the side slope that grades down. So the, the, the yeah. leveled surface on the top right now is planned to be 31 feet width, according to the plan three that look at, and then there's some additional width. No, you're, the you're driving... You're going to be able to drive on a 20 there's foot. 20 foot width for that, but then there's the run out guard rail, guard rail, rail there's the, uh, the. Yeah, the corridor will change. It will change. And we definitely want this type of input 
at the hopefully you'll, you and others will will come and participate on that virtual forum because the engineer will be right there to bounce those things off of and and, and to yeah, talk and, about and just as a comment about the speeds and public safety side of it so having personally been hit by a car um, and squeezed between a guardrail so that I seriously injured a leg you there's some challenges when you have to add a guardrail to a situation that can decrease the safety of that coupled with the fact that you're effectively straightening a portion of the road on one of them I believe um, reducing one of the radius of the turns and then also increasing the width which does increase speeds so according to the um, engineering speed management countermeasures from the Federal Highway Administration a two-foot decrease in the road brought speeds down from 39 miles an hour to 33 miles an hour and then just additional narrowing of with obstacles like the trees that we have all along the side of the road yeah we actually did that over at Farnham's they brought they brought the road to a narrow and it's helped quite a bit yeah. That type of thing, you should bring it up again, and our engineer will be able to speak to it as to whether it would be something, why or why not, you know, why wasn't it considered? That's the type of thing we want, that type of discussion. And I, I would just throw the, the question back, is the initial request for proposal to TUC for some design considerations for that, were there any requests in there or requirements to consider those uh, those design guidelines for traffic calming, trying to maintain a more rural thing rather than what they had quoted as, I can't remember the word, as a, uh, like a town or city street. Right, um, so there were no requirements that those things be looked at. I think a lot of the geometry has to do with the stream crossing because in order to get funding for that modified stream crossing to improve the ecology of the stream, we have to meet Massachusetts stream crossing standards we also have to meet Department of Transportation bridge standards under Chapter 80, 85 of the general laws. It's all part of the permitting. And again, I think our engineer will be able to speak to why we're going out to 20 feet, or proposing to, and why um, some of these other things may not work in this case. Yeah. Yeah, as well as just continuing guardrails over a bridge is required. However, continuing on past that, the, that same Ashto standard permits you to go over towards a recreational road, which can maintain an 18-foot width, and the scenic yeah, and if, designation would allow. And if that's possible, and and we don't have to do a guardrail, and because there's going to be a side slope, even though the once you go over the bridge, there's going to be a steep side slope. He'll be able to comment on all of that. That's what they do. Okay. So, and that that meeting and conversation is which one particular? So that so on November second, we're going to have me presenting generally the project to the senior citizens at the senior center, but everyone's welcome at 10 o'clock in the morning. 10.30, we all leave and we look at the causeway and we look at the project site. That night, November 2nd at 7, you can tune in to an all virtual public forum that is meant to see a presentation from the uh, engineers and then have that type of input and the other input that's been expressed both tonight and at previous nights and a lot of we're getting a lot of emails and letters we want to we want to take all that in before the design gets more finalized thank you thank you paul does anybody else have public comment janet hi janet carlson um 24 apple street so i want to support what the previous residents have um the questions they brought up and um, asked a couple of my own. Why and how did it get decided that the strategic planning but also the uh, Apple Street Forum would be virtual? It got decided that because um, we think it will be able to reach many more people that way and we're interested in you know, everybody's opinion on, on the matter. Okay, that's a two part. That's a two part answer. Actually, it was going to be virtual and in person, and the in person piece was going to be up here on the third floor. Originally, when the board of selectmen approved the Smithsonian exhibit, um, one of the prereqs was that these um, displays that you see behind you were supposed to be on wheels, and they were supposed to be able to part thread C to the sides of the building, and we were supposed to continue to have our meetings. Um, 
clearly that did not happen. Unfortunately, the exhibit is beautiful and we've had a lot of interest, but they do not move and they are very, very heavy. They're 800 pounds a piece, so we had to not do Right, and I was person. speaking to the November 2nd meeting because by then this stuff will be gone. Oh. But you're asking about both, right? The strategic oh, planning the strategic is virtual plan. and then the forum for Apple is virtual. You're asking about both? Yeah, I'm okay. So Ruth's Ruth's answer was strategic planning committee mm -hmm. um, originally was going to use this room. The reason it has to be in this room is because it's the only way we can do a hybrid meeting where we have some people in person and also we're doing what we do tonight. And so when the strategic planning committee heard that you couldn't have they couldn't have this room, that went 100% virtual. With respect to the um, the meeting for, for Apple Street, that was always going to be 100% virtual, and it's because there are going to be um, graphics and presentations and such that will be a lot easier for the different presenters to put that stuff up and have everybody um, able to see it wherever, you know, whatever device that, that they're looking at. We made that decision, and we, we want to make sure that as many people as possible, sometimes people need babysitters and they can't participate in a meeting that starts at seven o'clock at night. And so we, we said from the beginning that it would be a virtual presentation. Well, thank you. I, th I think it's um, disappointing in some ways because uh, I think p a lot of people want to show up and be together with their town officials. And that's how it worked with the public safety discussions, as you all remember. <laughs> um, and so I just want to say that that's very disappointing to me. Um, but moving on, I also want to ask the, um, the board, what, what else can we residents do besides keep, continue to ask you to consider asking our town administrator Zubricki to discuss with TEC different options as Nina brought up that are not going to be so devastating to this beautiful scenic byway. Um, I feel like the question's been asked but ignored, and I would really like to hear why you haven't done that. And I see that I've really stunned you because nobody is saying a thing. No, you haven't stunned me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll answer it. No, yeah. I understand Thank it. You. Thank you. Um, so my answer would simply be that as you've heard time and time again at meetings, anything you do in the municipal sector is extremely expensive. So going back to the drawing board with yet another type of design is gonna bring us back to square one. So we are three grants in and going for the fourth grant at this point. We're you know, four years in, the, the storm happened in 18, we started with the grant funding process in 19. So what you're essentially asking us to do is go back to the drawing board start from square one, come up with new designs. Um, without and basic, grants. Without grants. So you're, you're asking, you're saying, we don't want you to spend $4 million to do this project, but we want you to spend more money to come up with a different solution that doesn't impact Apple Street. Well, actually, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that the, all, the, all the residents of the town should be involved in deciding how, whether this, a, any scenic byway in Essex gets destroyed like this and I um, I think that the the government has a responsibility to um, to hear the people say we don't like this and we would like to consider other options and the grants could be put towards a different type of design a bridge as we've talked about my, as you know, my, my belief is that stationing the emergency vehicles on either side of the causeway solves the problem. So, um, but I do like the idea of talking a bit about the culvert and finding out when we will see designs for the culvert because I've consulted an engineer and a conservation expert, re both residents of Essex who have explained that the culvert can be widened without being elevated, and that solves the, pro the ecological problem. Um, so I would like to also yeah, that's, that's true. If we were just considering the culvert, absolutely, there are ways to deal with that. But it was always work on the ecological issue as well as the, the sea level rise threat issue. So if emergency vehicles are stationed on either side of town and the culvert is widened, um, we don't need to spend $4 million on a misguided... Um, but over, over 50 years, 
who knows how much it'll cost you to put vehicles on either side of the road, mm -hmm. which is what you will have to do more and more frequently. And is that an adequate solution into the future? And speaking about, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, there, people have tonight said, um, made <clears throat> reference to the threat of sea rise flooding Apple Street out of control. I just want to remind everyone that it's on the Massachusetts resiliency maps, and Simone mentioned this at a previous meeting. There, according to the maps that you have put on the town website, um, there is less than a 1% annual chance of Apple Street flooding until 2050. So there's confusion about that, at the very least. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the other Apple Street situation, which is um, the field at 30 Apple. Are you uh, aware, well, I should just mention that the executive director of Manchester Essex Conservation Trust called me a couple of months ago and told me that they are going to purchase the 84 acres of Van Wyck property, and they are interested in talking with Essex about carving off a little bit of that property on bordering on 22 for affordable housing. Is the town aware of this? The town is aware of this. Well, which one? Okay. Which the one, one off Essex of? Reach when I spoke with oh, Patrice. Okay. Yeah. Essex Reach. Yeah. So you're, you're speaking of Essex Reach? You're saying 22. Um, I, just I don't make know what it's called. I just know that it's that huge 84-acre property that Manchester Essex is going for and the Van, Van Wyck property. And hang on one second. I think there are actually two Van Wyck parcels. I think one's off Turtleback and one's off Essex Reach. We are aware of the one off Essex Reach, but I don't remember it being 84 acres. No. Was, that was not. Hang on one second, Janet. I did have conversations with Patrice. I don't recall which parcel. And there was some issues with not advancing forward with that. Hold one moment. That is the parcel. She does, re she does reference 84 acres. So, well, that's looks reach. Okay, so we did speak with Patrice about that. Go ahead. So just that it strikes me as way more logical to pursue affordable housing there than on this beautiful field that deserves to be um, preserved and conserved and respected. And so I just want to say here and be on record saying that that the Allen property, I understand all the important issues about liability there, but what a perfect place for affordable housing. And Apple Street, middle of nowhere, you can't walk to anywhere from there. But the Patrice and I talked about the um, a few acres from that, that they would be interested in carving off for affordable housing because they understand the issue is important in Essex. And I thought, um, if you weren't aware of it, I would uh, very much like to make you aware of it. And that, that is at least on 22 where, you know, people can get places and pick up um, transportation or get to a, a store like Tobacco Market. So um, I just wanted to speak in favor of remembering that aesthetics and open space are as important as affordable housing, and I'm and I support both. I'm very much in favor of both. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Good evening, everyone. My name is Priscilla Malbuff. Uh, you were kind enough to read a letter that I had written to the to board chair. I'm at 28 Apple Street. Um, Apple's a lot on your agenda, and I really appreciate you guys staying this late to hear us all. Um, I just wanted to, I, you know, I support what everyone has said here. There are a couple of things, though, that uh, strike me. I had not realized 
I'm a little bit late to this issue, but I had not realized that we had already been down the road to four grants to study this particular issue. I'm curious, have there been any other grants sought to pursue other alternatives? There haven't, and I think it's important to point out that the reason that these grants have been going in the direction that they've been going in is that we have a couple of guiding documents that brought these things up. Uh, in 2018, the state encouraged all communities to undertake a review of its liabilities when it comes to climate change, and that was the municipal vulnerability planning process, M municipal vulnerability preparedness planning process. In this very room, in 2018, I think I believe it was, we had a collection of experts, which included outreach to different sectors in the community as prescribed by the state, um, come and talk about the ma major issues that were facing the town. Apple Street and the Causeway Bridge actually rose to the forefront, and that ended up um, being put in as one of the top priorities for planning specifically to use Apple Street as a alternate travel path in the MVP process. Then in 2019, when the town had to renew its federal hazard mitigation plan, the town, through that process, also named Apple Street as an alternative travel path as something that was very important. So the reason that the three grants so far did all that groundwork to that point is because those two guiding documents had already said, this is what we need to do. We need to have Apple Street as, a, as an alternative travel path. So it's alternative to the causeway, right? So what's happening with the causeway? So um, when the causeway was redone a number of years ago, when new sidewalks were put in, do you recall that? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, the town, through the Board of Selectmen, asked, out, asked point blank, how come the design, this is of the state, because it was a state highway project, how come the design doesn't include anything more than a eight-inch rise in one little dip in the, in the causeway? And we were told that there's no way to bring the causeway up to where it would need to be without severely impacting the private properties and businesses that are already along there. And so at that time, the state determined that it was not going to do anything that would impact the businesses. Fast forward to the bridge that's being replaced right now, even more recently, we asked DOT through the Board of Selectmen again, can you at least consider putting the bridge itself up uh, and they said no, because the approaches to that bridge would be so long in order to come up as high as you need to get that you'd be having to buy property and put people out of business. So I think it comes down to uh, the fact that at, le at least at this point in time, where we haven't seen the flooding really start in earnest, the state is not willing to play the the interests of, of longstanding businesses against the potential benefits of roadway improvements, at least not at this point in time. So they're encouraging us to at least in emergency situations, like a flooding event that covers the causeway and sometimes can cover that part of Apple Street, they're encouraging us to invest there first. Interesting. So do these businesses, I mean, have you had conversations with the property owners there that basically they're being left behind in this planning process? They have been in the situation where they've been flooded out. Uh, I think it was 2018 again, where there were multiple storms uh, in a row where a lot of them had water and their I remember choice, that. Yeah. yeah, and their choice was to, uh, you know, rebuild, renovate, whatever the problem that occurred from the flooding was. I mean, that speaks so, to their direction. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't really answer my question, but that's okay. Um, I, I just, I find it interesting that we're talking about these types of issues in the shadow of these displays, 
that talk about the qualities of living in a rural community. And yet we're entertaining ideas that are going to materially alter that. Um, I can't speak to the engineering aspects and the, you know, the material issues that um, are addressing the flooding and the, or the not flooding and it feels very much like going after a fly with a baseball bat. I can speak to the fry field being adjacent to that. Um, the, the idea that, that we as a community would be more interested, that's okay, I, I won't keep you very much longer, um, would be more interested in developing that, that parcel than trying to maintain our community as a farming community. Thanks so much for hearing me out. Thank you, Priscilla. Is there any other comments from the board members? I'm set. You're good. Being 8.55 p.m., I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody.